Let's say they drop their address <laughs> and then you go beat them up. What would that do for you? Bring me happiness. Less likes. Less attention, maybe. Why do you need likes? You have a man. Ah. So if you're like anything over two inches, you'll probably be okay. Um, Damn it. <laughs> uh, he can't help you with that. Everything else no, except no, that. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Rub one told me. <laughs> Does work. But you have to be careful about ca clockwise versus counterclockwise. Really? Yeah. Okay. Of rubbing the tummy. Wait, yeah, are we recording? We just, yeah. Do you want to see? You can't do it yourself. Can I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta move forward. <laughs> so, close your eyes and tell me which way it feels right. That's. <laughs> I don't know my counterclockwise. No, 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 just, just, just wait. Just tell, tell me which one. Okay, so this is one way. Uh huh. And then now we're gonna go this way. Which way feels better? I don't like that. See? You can tell. Oh, whoa. To me, to me. Wait, 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 wait. So, so there is a difference of... Here, put it right by it so it catches in the, in the clip. Immediately, see? You can tell. Like, right away. He's like, I can't tell. Oh, no, no, I know that doesn't, that doesn't feel right. There's a right way of rubbing your tummy. Yes. And so that was... you Counterclockwise was when you said you didn't like it. Brother, I don't know my, my <laughs> See, clockwise you or my you counter. You don't need to know clockwise or counterclockwise. You just have to pay attention to your body, right? Wow. Like I've been doing That's... this for all of my life, so I'm just used to this uh... feeling. Interesting. That's the same for me, too. Yeah, I rub, so, I, rub, I rub clockwise. Yeah. So, so rubbing clockwise is going to be good because rubbing counterclockwise increases your emotional. This isn't like medical, by the way. <laughs> this is like more like Eastern. But one, one way will release emotions. And one way will like amplify emotions. Really? Whoa! <laughs> Every time I get. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, guys, we have a very special guest on today's episode. This is the smartest man on planet Earth, and he is paving the way, I would say, for just kind of reaching, I would say, the next generation and just interesting topics that I feel like a lot of us struggle with. Take out your pens and pat. Uh, take out your pens and paper, and. Please welcome Dr. K. Thank you all very much. I am not nearly as amazing as you make me out to be, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, we, we believe you're the smartest man on earth. Okay, well. <laughs> just first off, if you could give in one sentence or just, you know, what is, what is your way you like to kind of tell people what you do? Because there's so much of your business that you do. Uh, sure. So I'm someone who like grew up as an Indian kid in the United States. Mm. Uh, I'm the kid of, uh, can I use more than one sentence? Yeah. This is one thing. <laughs> um, I'm long winded. So I, I grew up like my, both my parents were doctors, right? So I was like your traditional Indian kid who's like, I'm going to go to medical school and be a <laughs> doctor, right? So I majored in pre-med, but like my head was like full of like ego and stuff. It was all about like status and like I wanted to be very impressive and because that's what happens, right? You're mm -hmm. like, you kind of grow up and your parents are like, oh, you should be like this kid. Like you should be like this and this we, kid went we to We all this. have that experience. A hundred percent. But you did it. We did it. Our <laughs> so hold on a second. Oh. So so that that's where, so I, I went to college and I was like, I'm going to be like the best doctor on the planet, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then I promptly failed out. So I got like addicted to video games, like, Played too much, like uh, joined a fraternity. What'd you play? Uh, Diablo two and Warcraft three. Oh, how'd you miss Starcraft? That's like the so yeah. So Starcraft was I barely skated through high school playing playing yeah. a bunch of Starcraft. <laughs> so then Warcraft three came out. Yeah. And um, I remember I was like talking to a girl at the time, and this was an absolute disaster. But then you know I kind of told her I was like, hey, this game is gonna come out, so like I'm not gonna be able to talk to you for <laughs> real, <while." laughs> real, real, real. So 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 <laughs> degenerate, you know. And I know the crazy thing was like I, I was super into her, and I just didn't. It didn't like cross my mind. Like I thought that like that's what you do, right? Like as you tell someone if you're gonna be like absent from their life for a little while. Yeah. I didn't realize like how much that <laughs> my chances. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I like joined a fraternity and stuff. I basically failed out of college. So after two wow. years, I had probably like a 1.8 GPA. Um, and I did my, better than him. Huh? I did better than uh, that's, uh, you guys. Uh, that's what I'm saying. You guys have no idea how smart y'all are and how much of an idiot I am. We'll learn that over the next couple of hours. Um, so I kind of failed out of college. I, my parents like tried everything. They tried like my, my, my mom sent me to a military academy for a little while in high school. Um, and then they tried everything. They tried like tough love and like you know, like, I don't know what the opposite of tough love is, soft love. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Asian parent, you can do no wrong love. Yeah. And none of it worked. So I ended up going, my dad sort of was like, you, we got to do something because this is not working. And I completely agreed. So I went to an ashram, which is like a monastery in Whoa. India. Um, so after about three months there, I decided I wanted to become a monk. And then, 
did that for about seven years or had plans to become a monk for about seven Wait, years. How old are you at this point when you're there? 21. 21. Okay. So I tried to take my vows then my teachers wouldn't let me. It's a story we can maybe get to. Um, and then, so I, I kind of came back and I was like, I'm going to be celibate, right? I'm going to be like, I'm going to be a monk. Uh -huh. And then as it turned out, I had a string of just terrible relationships in my first two years of college because I had no idea who I was and, and amongst all other problems. Um, but then once I became, once I decided like, okay, like I'm going to be celibate, like suddenly my ability to talk to women got so much better, right? Cause wow. there's no, there's no pressure. Oh. So I just can just be myself. And so, uh, you know, in a few months after that, like I met the woman who would later become my wife and we've now been married for, whoa, 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 whoa. hold anyway. on. So you're celibate, but then all of a sudden more women were coming into your life. And then yeah. how did so, you decide that you're like, okay, I'm breaking this. Yeah. So, so for a while it was a struggle. So remember, like I tried to take my vows and my teachers were like, not yet. And so I was like, cool. So I haven't taken my vows yet. So I was kind of like conflicted for a while. Like, okay, like, do I want to be a monk? Do I not want to be a monk? Like even when my wife and I started dating, I told her, I was like, you know, at some point, like I'm going to become a monk. Um, and so that, ha that happened for a while, but ultimately monk was not in the cards. So when I was about 28 decided I wanted to go to medical or a couple of years before that decided I was going to try for medical school. It took me about three years to get in because it's hard to get into med school with like a 2.5 GPA. Um, but then ended up going to med school. And then when I finished med school, decided I wanted to become a psychiatrist. So ended up, um, uh, becoming a psychiatrist. Wait, why? Like what, 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 what was your experience in med school where you were like, this is actually what I want to specialize in. So it's a great question. So, I started out like thinking I was going to do oncology, which is like cancer medicine, right? Because I was going to be like a real doctor and like fucking save lives, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm going to cure cancer, cure cancer, right? That's, that's what good Indian and Asian kids do is they become surgeons and do heart transplants and cure cancer. Um, and so it took me a while to sort of realize that what I loved about becoming a monk was like, I loved the mind. So I, I really thought it was really fascinating because I'd struggled so much with like partying, gaming addiction, whatever. Um, and then I sort of discovered this thing in India where it's like, okay, like this is how you understand like yourself, right? This is what your ego is. This is where your desires come from. Here is how you conquer your desires. Here is how you understand your emotions and all this kind of stuff. And I thought it was super cool. So then in, in med school, I sort of fell in love with the mind and like, I was like, okay, so I'm going to become a psychiatrist and my family wasn't very happy. Hmm. <laughs> so my grandmother was like, you know, like you're going to be working with crazy people, right? You're going to like end up crazy. Like you've got to be careful. Um, why don't you do cardiology or something? <laughs> and, uh, but then ultimately decided that, yeah, psychiatry was like right for me. Um, and then once I started doing psychiatry, I, I started talking to uh, my mentors. So I, I trained at a place called Massachusetts General Hospital um, or McLean Hospital. And these are both Harvard Medical School teaching affiliates. So some of the best hospitals in the country. And so the, the leaders in the field of psychiatry are like, I'm learning from these people. And I asked them, like, what do you all think about technology addiction, gaming addiction? And they're like people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So they're like, eh, we don't really know. So I realized, like, okay, this is weird because no one in psychiatry is focusing on this. So this was back in 2015. So I started working on tech addiction, like, back then because no one else was. Wow. Um, and then ultimately started Healthy Gamer, which was also like a nights and weekends thing. So I was... Yeah. I don't know. So explain to the audience what Healthy Gamer is and how it started. Yeah. So basically what happened is I was uh, at uh, General, right? And I, I sort of had this reputation because I had studied all this like alternative medicine in India and studied yoga and meditation. So my main um, area of interest was evidence-based complementary and alternative medicine. So for people who like wanted to use like yoga or meditation or herbs uh, instead of traditional psychiatric treatments like SSRIs or medications, they would come to me. And that was very successful. So um, I started like having a, I had a private practice where like CEOs and people from like the MIT incubator and Harvard Business School and like all these like famous people started to come to see me. And then I realized there's no shortage of people to help them. And that like there's a whole, there's a silent crowd of literally millions of people who are 25 years old living at home in their parents' basement. And there's like no one to help them. They're never going to see a psychiatrist. They're never going to leave the house. And like, these are my people. Like these are the degenerates that I That's used me. to be. Yeah. 
right? So to, on that tip, so, and I'm scared to get, well, actually, I'm not scared because now I've heard your story. I'm like, okay, I understand where you started from, but to me, gaming is a net negative activity overall in the full scope of things. Hearing your story, my personal experience, my friend's personal experiences, an example I would give is like, if I had spent 10,000 hours learning real guitar instead of playing Guitar Hero, I could be the front man for Harry Styles. And ultimately, none, I got nothing out of except wasted time and sitting in my room and turning down, hanging out with my friends and real life experiences from playing Guitar Hero. You know, sometimes a friend would come over, we play together. And I would say that it's like such a small percentage of people that turn it into a profession and make a bunch mm -hmm. of money off of it. What is your opinion on gaming overall? Is like because that that's something that you're you know fixing every single day, or yeah. So it's going to be kind of weird, right? So you say it's a net negative. Mm -hmm. I both agree and disagree. So let me ask you all this. So like I sit before you today, and you guys think that I'm the smartest man on the planet, right? <laughs> what makes you think I'm the smartest plant man on the planet? I've listened to your, uh, I've seen you in debates, and then I've also watched your videos, and I've also. Yeah, from from those things, I'm like this guy studies okay. and he tries things and he has opinions and he's cured people from difficult problems. Okay, uh, you just wear a suit. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We're you have only, different we're, opinions. We're the only than two people in this room wearing suits. That's yeah. What I'm saying. <laughs> you always have different opinions than other people. Like things you say things that. I wouldn't usually hear from other people. Okay, so fair enough, right? So I, I and I, I think it's very easy to view gaming or anything that happens in our life in a negative way. So when I was growing up, I had, I could not conceive of a single scenario in which having a 2.5 GPA was better than having a 4.0, right? Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. no, there's no advantage. A 2.5 is objectively worse in every capaci capacity than a 4.0. And at the same time, if I was the kid, and we all know these kids, right? Because they're like Asian kids who have 4.0s, and mm -hmm. then there's presumably us. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe you all had 4.0s. <laughs> no, but, no, you know, no, you were right. That's why you're the smartest man. <laughs> yeah. No, but, so, but so that's the thing, right? So I'm a 2.5 kid. Yeah. And, and so when I really look at it, like even now, if you look at something like brand, why, do I, why am I able to help the people that I'm able to help? It's mm. because I know what it's like to be a degenerate. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to fail out of college. And like, I remember I used to, when I went home, like after my first semester and, and first year of college, I would sneak out to the mailbox every morning to steal my transcript so that my parents would not see it. Right. And like, so having lived through that stuff and then sort of going from a 2.5 to being studying and being faculty at Harvard Medical School, if I had been just one of the other 4.0 kids, like that would be nothing special. Mm. And so I think one of the things that we, in our society today, we look at like, we're so good at separating people into good and bad, like successful and unsuccessful, smart and stupid. We make all these comparisons. And the big lesson I've learned is that, you know, everything is a part of your life for like a reason. And there's nothing that's good or bad. It's the way that we view things that ultimately determines what it is. Mm -hmm. So if I had not become addicted to video games, like I wouldn't be here, uh, right? Mm. But then overall, like, like back to the original question of gaming being that negative, are you basically saying like maybe it, it's good for people to go through those pains so that they like, cause you know what I'm saying? Versus yeah. like, I'm sure you're kind of being out there being like, Hey, avoid the pain that I went through. Don't play video games nine hours a day. Don't be an inset. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. What do, Don't ignore your girl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, what, yeah, what is, what, what is, so the, the pros, I understand the pros where you're like, it, it's, it's how I think we all understand failure. It's like failure is what brought us to this position today. Yeah. So you could, failures are the best lessons, right? You're learning yeah. when you're failing. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, yeah, with gaming, it's like, yeah, maybe I would have been. I guess it's like the butterfly effect. You never know what would have yeah, the so, turnout been. So I, I'm not advocating. So I, and, and well said. Uh, it's it, what was your name again? Jeremy. Jeremy. Okay. Um. So well said, Jeremy. So like I, I think I'm not. So while on the one hand, failure is not all bad. On the other hand, I'm not advocating that everyone spend ten thousand hours learning Guitar Hero instead of learning to play guitar, <laughs> right? So the, and that's what we really kind of focus on is healthy gaming. So. I used to be addicted to video games. I still play video games. I still love video games. I teach my kids how to play video games. We play together. <laughs> and, and so I think especially when it comes to technology, like we have to realize that this is a real thing in the world. 
And for many people, it's going to be basically impossible to stop. So with gaming, maybe you can. But if we look at the behavioral addictions like shopping addiction, addiction, uh, to a certain degree like gaming addiction, let's say, or social media addiction. So when it comes to addictions, like for alcohol addiction, we can you can get by with being sober. But like you can't get by without purchasing things, mm -hmm. right? So what do you do if you're like addicted to shopping or addicted to gambling or like, you know, whatever? So I, and I think that's where... The, the right way to approach it is whether gaming is negative or not negative is not about the activity. It's about you and your relationship with it. Mm. So you can absolutely make the argument that you would be better off if you never played a video game and just acquired skills all the time. Mm -hmm. But you could also make that argument about like anything in life, like never eat fried food, never do this, never do this. And you could objectively eat like salads and, you know, but like, that's not what life is about. Life is about having fun. And so it's just about developing a healthy relationship with, to mm. the thing, as opposed to thinking that this is good or bad. Yeah, I could do like anywhere between 70 to $100,000 a month. Probably. Solid. My drink does not sell well at this store and I'm trying to figure out why. I've never heard of it. It doesn't even have a sign. So maybe it's unknown, but let's go inside, figure out why we're not doing so well. Hello. Do oh, you know where the alcohol order. section is? Uh, all the way to the market area. You know what's kind of interesting of how empty the shelves are? I actually don't even see us. Oh. Right here, we are out of stock. That's a no-no. That could probably explain why we're not doing so well. But you know what's also interesting about this? If you guys want free stickers, pop them up here, Warren. All you have to do is take a photo of this shelf, ask a store employee if it's in the back, and if it's not in the back, text us this photo, tell us the address of the store that's out of stock, and I'll send you these stickers for free. One of the owners of one of the drink companies, and we're out of stock, and I just want to see if we're in the back, and then I can merchandise it. Thank you. I wonder if they uh, just ghosted me. So as you can see, we've been standing here waiting for quite some time. All these little store checks take a lot of time and that's nobody's fault. It's just part of the game We have people on our team that do this every single day It's so important that the store shelf stay stuck because I can't control when someone wants to go buy our drink So when they do go you want it to be on the shelf. My name is Jeremy I'm the owner of nectar okay. and I, I just wanted to see if there's a way to check to see if there's any in the back stock so Just because our spot on the shelf was empty. Okay. Thank you, you, need to come in here if you want. Oh sweet uh, so that one I don't have any okay I'll let our distributor know is there a rough number of how much alcohol is sold every week at this target the last week alone just for adult beverage it was 10 grand oh okay yeah so it's not like super crazy target behind the scenes fascinating <laughs> i gotta figure out if that's a lot or a little to me that seems a lot lower because we went to that one target in hawaii they do like 200,000 or something ridiculous i still gotta post that video i gotta check it against what like a bevmo does yeah. you know life is about beating the out of that kid that plays like a rat on fifa and then messaging oh. him 20 messages saying telling him to drop his address so you can pull up on him so what he, hey so listen he started fifa and fifa was just his fun activity and yeah. now it's turned into this where he wants to beat up a 12 year old kid you know? so it's like, like that so so you know it's like it's like it always starts off healthy right i'm just gonna play this video game it's when because for me personally it was like yeah, setting that level of discipline is so hard when it's so easy. It's so easy to pick up this phone and open TikTok and scroll on it endlessly and then 30 minutes go by and I'm like, you know, and then I feel kind of guilty but not really and then that habit happens again an hour later and then three months later I'm like, any second, like if I'm bored, I'm picking it up, right? Yeah, so the yes. discipline is really hard. You wanted to say something yesterday? Okay. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm listening. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and, and I, I think, you know, so I'm curious, like, were you joking about the FIFA thing? or Absolutely or not. I so tell, tell, tell me more about that. All the time. Yep. What? <laughs> I tell people to drop their address all the time on FIFA. Because he fights and, with them and tells yeah. them to And fall. What, what, why do you want them to drop their address? Because, so in FIFA, when I say, like, when people play like a rat, it's like, they they do stuff to break the game mechanics. FIFA is a dog sh game. I hate the game so much. Um, and this year is the worst rendition of it. So people will do things in the game that like break the mechanics, right? And that's how they win. So that's what I classify as like playing like a rat. And then in my head, I get very angry when I when I like I know I'm good at FIFA, but when I lose to sh that I. I was literally about to say, can we cuss? I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know. you can cuss. Um, yeah, so when I lose to sh that I don't think I should lose to, then I get pissed. Then I message them calling them a loser. Okay. Then if they respond, then I get even more pissed. Then I tell them to drop their address, hoping they're underage so I can probably beat them up. Okay. <laughs> oh, my and then, goodness. And, and so, like, let's just let's think through that, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, like, let's say they drop their address <laughs> and then you go beat them up, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And what would that do for you? Bring me happiness. Why? I want to beat their. I'm with you, right? So, so what? <laughs> He's gonna so pull up I, with I'm, you. I'm not. I'm not. 
Yeah, I'm with you physically. <laughs> so we'll have a doctor on the premises, right? So, <laughs> you need, somebody needs medical attention. Okay, so but let's let's. I understand that it brings you happiness, right? So have you ever done it? No. But how do you know it brings you happiness? I found my friend one time. <laughs> right. So let, let's like understand this, right? So if we want to yeah. understand, like, what about beating up a 12 year old kid? <laughs> brings you happiness instead of instead of judging him right which is what we're all doing like oh look at this guy is such a degenerate right yeah. and you're even joking about it we all know that he's not actually going to do it he's going to get his ass whipped if he rolls up <laughs> yeah. and, and this 12 year old kid but but let, let's think about this right because this is what happens with technology and and we can be sitting here judging vit vit yeah, for all right. this kind of stuff but we're no different Right. So like we we like we look at we look at social media and, and we have little bits of anger because someone else is like using a filter and we're not using a filter <laughs> and they get more likes than we get. And like we all have this version of an internal reaction to a piece of technology. True, true, true. And then once we have that internal reaction, it's usually negative. And then that internal reaction drives us to a behavior that will then bring us happiness. Right. So this mm. cycle, we're not like we're here. We are judging this guy, but we're no different. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've lost to the same. people who damn cheese and in, in video. It's cheese, yeah, it's right? Cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's yeah. like no skill. Like you got to just exploit. Yeah, it's this fucking stupid annoying. yeah. In, in my head, it's just like. You, like, you just have no honor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. so we live our lives by honor. Uh, yeah. Like, look at this, this guy. This guy's I honor. live and die by this game with honor. And you, yeah. You right. Just don't have any yeah. honor. You're and scary when you play games. I walked into your house and you were like, <laughs> and then and then I realized that he was playing with friends. He wasn't just playing with random people. Oh yeah, no. Me. And I was just like, well, you talk to your friends like that." <laughs> yeah. So like like let's understand that, right? So like here you are, you're playing this game, you're getting angry, and then you want to do something that's going to make you happy. So how does that, like, what's going on within us when we're doing this? Mm. Mm. I mean, you tell me, you're the doctor. I don't know. <laughs> Man, this is getting too deep okay. for me. <laughs> so let's understand this first. So when we have an internal emotion like anger, mm -hmm. what, what is, how do you manage your anger in a perfect world? In a perfect world? Like in the um, world, not, not, not in a perfect, uh, in a world that, in a non pro so how how would you, how do you manage your anger? Let's just like, stick with that. As of currently? Yeah. Normally just punch the wall. Oh you right? gym. Oh yeah, I also go to the gym. Okay. That's that's a new thing I picked up. Before this though, I literally would just throw like I would hit stuff. And how does it how does it make you feel to hit stuff? <laughs> so good. Why? Um Well, I used to have anger management problems. And I growing up, like, I guess that's just all I saw. So You wanna say more about that? You don't have to. Uh, I mean, I can. The audience knows. Uh, I had a pretty rough childhood. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I would never put my hands on women or, like, anything like that. But, like, I like fighting. Or I used to like fighting. What did you like about it? Adrenaline. <clears throat> and then, um, honestly, I don't know. I did, my, it might just be adrenaline. Okay. But yeah. there was a period in my life, too, where I, I felt like I had to prove to myself and the world that I was a man. Okay. And, the only way I knew how to do that was through fighting. And has that changed for you? I would say so, yeah. What's Nowadays changed? I can uh I can walk away much easier. Doesn't that make you less of a man though? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I feel I feel like it does, but sometimes the mature side of me is like this does not make me less of a man. So when you feel like you're less of a man, let's say that the immature side wins. Uh huh. How do you fix that feeling? <laughs> well, either I beat them up or they beat me up. Very good, right? So yeah. even if you lose, yeah. if you get your ass beat, you're still more of a man than if you walk away, right? Yeah, yeah, that is how I think. Right? Because I, I, th there's a saying that I, I live my life by. It's, I would rather bleed out on the streets than let another man hold me, which is basically like, like nobody's ever going to make me feel like a punk or a Right, I so, would rather die than have that happen. Yeah. So, so now we like get this is beautiful. You're amazing, dude. Thank you. Um, so let, let's just understand handsome. a couple of things. Huh? Huh? <laughs> what? I said you're very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> similar style. Yeah, on, <laughs> um, even our, even our tattoos are really similar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hairs, <laughs> tattoos. Yeah. yeah. It's just mine are somewhere else. <laughs> you tatted? Oh yeah. Really? Oh Below wow. The belt. <laughs> no, I'm uh, so so let's let's understand something. Okay, mm -hmm. let's understand a couple of things. This is this is great. So if we look at it, so if there's an internal reaction in VIT, 
what he does is takes action to change the internal reaction. Hmm. Right. So, and then, and then he's kind of saying like, okay, so you don't want any other person to, you said, hold you, hold me. What does that mean? Hold like, him back. Uh, right. No, like, no ho, ho, ho. Make oh. you look like a, ho. ho you. Like yeah. I hold you. Like if I made fun of you and you just were like, oh, and you yeah. walked away, I'm like, I just hold you. It's basically like, like disrespect bitch you. Bitch me. Yeah. Or like, okay. Right. Right. So, so there, there's a couple things that we got to be super careful about is that when we have an internal reaction, uh-huh. if we have to act to shape that internal reaction. I don't know if this makes sense, but suddenly these internal reactions take control of our life, right? So like once someone makes him feel like less of a man, he either, he has two choices. He can be a bitch or he can fight. Mm -hmm. And now what's happened is all I have to do to control Vit is just make him feel like less of a man. So that, now, I like, it's super... my biggest weakness, yeah. Absolutely, right? So I can, like, we can... You're, here you are playing Guitar Hero. So as a psychiatrist, what we do is we play the instrument of human beings, yeah. right? So, like, we play people like we play instruments. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is really important to understand. When you talk about being mature, what does that mean to be mature? That means not letting your internal reactions dictate your actions. Mm. And if we want to understand what makes an unhealthy relationship with technology, the unhealthy relationship is that... FIFA and some <laughs> punk who's, who's, what is it? Uh, who plays like a rat. Play, <laughs> so, so now suddenly, your tranquility and your happiness today, you are surrendering to this <laughs> punk who chooses to play by a rat. You are giving him all of the power. Absolutely. Because you're saying, hey, if you play by a rat, you're going to ruin my life. You know, this guy, this guy, you know, this 12-year-old, what he can do? He can damage your walls. Because all he has to do is play by like a rat and he can bust your stuff. Mm. He controls you and then you start throwing things. You start punching things. Yeah. See how much control you are giving him over your life. True, true, true. So Damn. this is this is the same problem with technology is we surrender control of our life to these kinds of things. Oh, I posted something on social media and I got 10 likes. That makes me feel bad. So I'm going to use a filter. And now... I get 50 likes. This makes me feel good. That's that's the thing about me, though, is like, I don't like care about social no, media <laughs> huh? uh, when it comes to likes. What I care about on social media is when people like call me broke. Okay. I don't Yeah, like I'm, it. when I'm talking about likes, I'm not talking to you. Oh. <laughs> talking to... <laughs> <laughs> right? We have an audience here. I've, I've even posted, uh, I've posted TikToks. That, like, I don't know. Likes is like, I just I shit post. I spam post. So we're going to talk about likes. We've got to talk to Esther. Yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I have a question. Okay, so what do you think about um, how filter is like ruining people's self esteem and like, and and what's called? Are um, filters ruining society? Yeah. So basically. you ask you ask me what do I think about how filters are ruining self esteem? That's Esther's question. Yeah. And then Jeremy comes in and asks a worse question, <laughs> which is what do I think? So I'm gonna turn that back around because he's trying to protect you, Esther. <laughs> you tell me. How are filters, what are they doing to your self-esteem? Um, okay, well, when I take regular pictures, mm-hmm. I, and I look at them, and I'm just like, damn, are you really that ugly? You know, but then but then when you start adding filters or, like, Photoshopping a little bit, then you're just like, yeah, you look good. And then when you post it, you feel good. But it's just like, I feel like it's a constant fight with myself because now whenever, like, like I go to a, a photo shoot or whatever, and then I see it, and it's not edited, and it has to be up. Then I'm just like, do I really look like that? You know, and it, and it has ruined my like. I feel like I have body dysmorphia. Sure. You know, so and, and that's something that I've been trying to like get away from, but it's like super hard. I feel like I'm addicted to it. Yeah. So how do you try to get away from it? Um. Well, first off, I started photoshopping less. Okay. Just a little bit, you know, like here and there. <laughs> but before, it was like, if I look at my old pictures, I'm like, this is not even you. <laughs> it's like, why is your eyes that big, <laughs> you know? But yeah, this now I'm just like, yeah, just a little bit. Maybe okay. like take a take some pimples off or... <laughs> and and so let, let's, let's understand this, right? So uh-huh. it's the same thing as, as this guy, where it's uh-huh. like suddenly like I feel a certain way and I can take a particular action and then that can change the way that I feel. Uh-huh. So let me ask you this. What's the problem with you having a pimple? I mean, it's not attractive. Like in my head, I'm just like, oh, this is not. It's What's not the problem with being unattractive? Well, then less likes. 
<laughs> less attention, maybe. Why do you need likes? You have a man. Ah. Well, we, so, so, so let's let's uh-huh. ask, right? So, what's the value of likes? Um, popularity, I guess. What's the value of popularity? More money. Okay. Sure. Uh huh. So let me ask you this: What was high school like for you? High are y'all school? still in, are y'all in high school? No, no. no <laughs> high school <laughs> was uh, was quite fun. It was uh, I don't like. Like you, my GPA was very low, <laughs> so I was just hanging out with friends, and yeah, just. I dropped out of high school. I never even finished. No. I ran away when I was seventeen. <laughs> Wait, isn't that when you're out of high school, or that's senior year? That's senior year. I ran away during senior. Oh, okay, senior. yeah. Why do you laugh? What? It's funny. Um. Anyways, yeah. No. Uh. High school was good. High school was good. Did, was popularity important to you? Uh. Maybe not really, actually. Not in high school. Not in high school, necessarily. When did that change? When did that change, the popularity? I guess once I started going on social media. And I wasn't super into social media when I was in high school. Um, but during quarantine, that's when I started TikTok. That's when I started like Instagram. And so that's when I was just like, damn, this dopamine that I feel when I get likes, comments, and like, you know, whatever, is just like addict- addicting, you know? And so, so it sounds like, and so did you, when did you start to feel concerned about the way that you looked? Uh, when did I, I mean, I guess when people start to put their input on how you look, that's when you're just like, oh, maybe, maybe this person is right. I'm getting a little fat or like, or like, oh yeah, my my face is like breaking out, stuff like that. So people's input. Yeah. Which people? Sadly. Uh, internet, maybe people like I meet. In real life as well. And which then, uh-huh. which one do you think hurt you more? Mm, probably. Actually, yeah. Internet. Yeah, but weird, not, right? not not anymore as much. But back then it did bother me because I was new new to social media. And I was like, damn, these people are mean. Yeah, so the internet probably. Yeah. So how do you feel about yourself today? I feel pretty good. I have days when I look in look in the mirror and say, damn, she looks tired, but I, I'm not like She's ugly. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think a lot of this stuff is, is just about, so like if I listen to that story, thank you so much for sharing, Mm -hmm. by the way, you too, but, um, you know, let's like kind of understand a couple things. So the first is that the internet is really good at amplifying what is on the inside. So you say that you're not so concerned about popularity and like that's, we'll take that at face value, but generally speaking, most people in high school are concerned about popularity, Mm -hmm. right? And so even if you weren't one of the popular kids, you kind of like downplayed it a little bit. I know this was the way that I was, where I sort of like devalued the stuff that I wasn't good at, Mm. right? So if like, I wasn't one of the popular kids, like I remember when I was like 15 years old, like I was sitting in the library one day and the hottest girl in my came and sat next to me. And I was like, she's playing some prank or something. She started like talking to me and stuff. I was like, what is this? Like, where are the cameras? Mm. Like... (laughs) When's the other shoe going to drop? It took me many years to realize that she was just a nice girl, Hmm. right? And like everything else was what I was adding. And she was like, okay, there's some kid who's not popular, who's sitting by himself. Let me actually be a decent human being and go and say hello, which is, I think, all she was doing. But even then, like if you sort of think about it, our mind adds all of this stuff to these experiences. Mm -hmm. And so when I was not popular in school, like I stopped caring about popularity where deep down I really did. Like what does every kid, maybe I'm projecting here, but I think most kids want to be popular in high school. Absolutely. You're right. And and so then what we do is we say like, okay, like I'm not going to win this game. So I'm going to stop playing. I'm going to stop caring about it. And so then what happens, though, if you really pay attention, is that there's a seed of that desire for popularity. And then, Esther, you got fucked because at some point, now suddenly you get to play that game. As you become an influencer, as you start to become beautiful, as now suddenly that that thing that you wanted when you were 15, 14, 13, 12, who knows? I'm assuming here, right? So Mm -hmm. it may not apply to you, but... I imagine it'll apply to a lot of people who are listening. Now you get to play that game, but that sort of seed of insecurity, that that lack of confidence and all that kind of stuff is still at the root. And then what happens is we have the internet, which is really, really good at amplifying our insecurities Mm -hmm. because the human brain is not designed to deal with the internet. So if we sort of look at it like, there's even studies on this where, so I, I, I stream. And the interesting thing is if you look at like the chat during streaming, 
it goes by faster than you can read it. Like literally, like you cannot read bazillion words a second. And yet if one person makes a negative comment, my brain can pick that out mm -hmm. of the thousand comments. <laughs> Right, so I would bet money that if we go to any random post of Esther's, 99% of people will say good things. Mm -hmm. But our brain is wired in this really weird way, which we can get into if y'all want to, which Absolutely. is that it ignores 99% of the positive and zeroes in on the negative. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so now what's going on is like there's the seed of insecurity from potentially high school or earlier, mm -hmm. or we grow up in, in a culture where like prettiness is really great. And it can be like little things. It can be like, you know, when you're 12 or 13 and your parents are talking about like 18 year olds or 20 year olds or 24 year olds and y'all go to a wedding and everyone's like, oh, look at how pretty she is. And then a couple months later, you go to another wedding where someone's less pretty, maybe a little bit more overweight and people don't make those comments and kids can tell the difference. We pick Absolutely. up on the difference. We pick up on the subtle ways in which our value, our society values certain attributes. And so that seed is there. Social media amplifies it. Um, we get into this like problem with our brain where we like hyper, uh, we, we in inflate or amplify negative signals from social media, which then drives more of our insecurity. And then we get into this other problem, which is like, if you post a picture of yourself and it's filtered and people like it more, how do you feel about yourself? Mm -hmm. What do you I mean, okay, so like if someone was, if I was to upload a filtered picture and people liked it more, that would make me, oh, as opposed to if I was to upload a picture that wasn't filtered or just. Yeah, so let's say like you, because like if you upload a filtered picture, uh -huh. you're going to get more likes. Uh -huh. And you, if you upload a non filtered picture, you're going to get less likes. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried that yet, actually. Mm -hmm. okay. I've never, I've never posted a <laughs> picture that wasn't filtered. Why not? I, because I see, like, you know, if I see myself in person, I'm just like, yeah, you look cute, but this picture that was taken of you at this angle isn't up to par. Okay. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, I just never posted a picture. Why not? Because uh, I think I look better in real life than in the pictures, but so I Photoshop it. a joke. Huh? Turn it into a joke. What do you mean, how? Like, I love posting ugly pictures of myself, but just like, it's joke. Well, the ugly photos, like, of the joke ones are... Are, are up there oh. those are not edited but yeah i'm not i don't want to be joke of the town damn <laughs> i do <laughs> so, yeah so that's the difference you guys uh -huh. see the difference like uh -huh. what he can do uh -huh. and what you can't because uh -huh. he's way like he, pain has been his friend so dogging himself is no problem uh -huh. he's, he's been on the mm -hmm. you can see it in his face sorry uh -huh. <laughs> I, you know what? I think this has also affected me. Like people calling me like, oh, you're so pretty and stuff. Like as flattering as that is, I feel like you crave it more. Yeah. And so, if people don't give you that, you're just like, damn, did I get ugly? You know what I mean? So, so this is where like we can get to some weird stuff. We can go the mm -hmm. neuroscience route or the... We can go the neuroscience route or the spirituality route. But mm -hmm. if, if you look at like the the yogic or buddhist kind of conception see we have this thing called the ahamkara or the ego so the ego is the sense of i or the i feeling and any attribute that you can apply to yourself is not actually who you are it's a part of the ego so just to give you all a simple example like i'm a doctor right like what like so i I'm, let me think about how to explain this so i was me before i was a doctor and I was me after I graduated from medical school. So like, I'm always me. You're always the same person, but you can attach different attributes. You can attach being successful. You can attach being ugly. You can attach being beautiful. You can attach being attractive, unattractive. All of these, these attributes that the outside world gives you, I don't know if this makes sense because it's so oh, foreign, probably. are not actually you. So like if an alien picked me up and like transplanted me to a desert island or I lived in an alien zoo for the rest of my life, would I still be a doctor? No. Right? But like I still have the same knowledge. The piece of paper with the medical degree is sitting at home. <laughs> right? Why am I? So this is exactly what I mean is you could say like, yeah, you are still a doctor. But then what does it mean to be a doctor if I'm sitting in a zoo like I can't practice medicine? Mm -hmm. 
And, and so I, I, I've seen this a lot with, you know, uh, like, for example, women that I work with who have, have to have like hysterectomies or have mastectomies because of mm -hmm. cancer, where it's like, what does it mean to be a woman? Well, being a woman means like having breasts or being able to have children. And if you remove a uterus from a woman for a medical reason, is she still a woman? I'm not trying to get into the transgender debate. I'm just pointing yeah. out that we have, if you really pause and think about it, who you are is very different from the identity that you construct. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is that like you could uh, upload a picture or not upload a picture, but at the end of the day, like when you're taking a in the morning, you're the same human being, whether you're beautiful or not beautiful. You're just someone taking a shit. And when you eat something, the taste of the food does not change depending on whether you have a billion dollars or a million dollars, right? So like the, the fundamental of experience of life and who you are is like, I know it sounds kind of weird, entirely internal. And then the problem is that we get confused about like who I am. And then once we start to develop this ahamkar, this ego, then that thing needs more. Then it's not enough, right? So if you really pay attention, like now that you feel pretty, if you're not careful, your ego is going to need more. It's not enough to be prettier than these three people. Now you need to be prettier than this person. And now you need to be prettier than this person. And it never ends. So it's like the more you feed the beast, like, you know, y'all have pets. Like when you feed a dog, what happens? What's more? It grows and it wants more. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening right now is, is especially with social media is we are creating these personas that are not actually who we are. And then we get into a really interesting trap, which is that when you actually look at the person that you are in the mirror, you don't like what you see. Damn. <clears throat> to me, I'm like, the way that you would combat this is, is to me is uh, gratitude. It, you could be like, cause, cause it's kind of like a, if, if social media is your career and that's how you make your money, it's like, you got to make good videos. There's, there's a level of like you be having your, your YouTube channel. It's not just there. There's probably, I mean, you're probably different. Somebody else that has a successful YouTube channel is probably like, Oh, I need to constantly make this better because I get more views. It fuels my business. Everything grows. And I know I'm doing it right. Like if the video flops, if I have 2 million followers and I get a thousand views on my video, it's like what's going on, right? It's probably I'm not putting out, you know, I'm not, even, even if you want to just talk about skills, I'm not putting the maximum amount of my skills when I used to be able to get a million views a video. Um, so to me, it's like, it's like, it's such a difficult balance of, of ego versus like putting your best and creating something that people can enjoy. And then, yeah, I'm, it's just, it's so, it's, it's to, to draw that line of, when it's ego versus like, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling here, but it's like so difficult so, to combat that. So it's, it's the, the only reason. So let's first understand something. What's the different be difference between something that is difficult and something that is easy? It's the amount of time it takes. To okay, that's one way to achieve. What other thoughts? I'm just like, if it's easy, it's easy. If it's difficult, it's difficult. The amount so, of effort. <laughs> the amount of effort. Okay. So like, What's something that's easy for you, Vit? Mm. Eating ramen. No. I think you're trying to think of something profound. <laughs> Using big words. Okay. Using big words is easy? Yeah. Okay. I love big words. What, what is something that's easy for you, Esther? Um, brushing my eyebrows. Okay. Um, so what's something that's hard for the two of y'all? <laughs> getting up in the morning being serious okay <laughs> right so if we sort of look at like these different things like mm -hmm. so you say brushing your eyebrows is easy like i don't know how to do that like brushing my eyebrows is hard right so there are certain things that are easy and hard for all human beings and if you really look at it the big difference is competence so if you like look at someone who doesn't know how to do algebra like doing algebra is hard mm. Mm -hmm. And then once you learn how to do something like change a tire or brush your eyebrows or you read a dictionary, right? Then it becomes easier to use big words. So the only difference is it's, it's not like, it's not like internal, some deep value or anything like that. It's not smart. It's actually just skills. So similarly, when you say that it's so hard to tease apart ego versus ambition versus metrics versus performance. No, it isn't. It's just, we haven't been taught how to do it. That's all. Mm. 
So let's understand this, right? So I pay attention to metrics and stuff. The only difference is that I try, and I've gotten pretty good at it now, right? So practice, is that my personal sense of worth or value is not tied to my performance. So this is like the big difference is like the big irony is that I wanted to go to Harvard Medical School and I failed out of college because I had a goal. But that goal was very ambitious and there was ego involved and stuff like that. And then at some point I decided like all that. I'm not, I don't care about where I end up. I'm going to focus on learning the best medicine that I can. So I realized in medical school, like you can want to do all this shit, whatever. It's like great and egotistical. But at the end of the day, like I remember I had a really terrifying moment in medical school I was working in the emergency room where a patient came in with a, a, a couple of gunshot wounds. And like, as I watched people like saving this person's life, cause I wasn't doing much. I realized that at some point, like whether a human being lives or dies depends on how hard I study. It doesn't matter whether I go to Harvard or Texas tech or whatever, like all that stuff is just ego. Mm -hmm. What am I actually in medical school for? It's that. And I remember like I had this other moment when I was interviewing for residency where this is the scariest moment for a doctor until you've done it a couple times is that you'll hear something, you're on a flight and then you hear this thing over the PA, like, is there a doctor on board? And it's like, Oh, shit. right. And then I remember in that moment, I was praying that someone else would have been there because now it's like, I'm the dude, like I'm the only one here. Yeah. And whether this person lives or dies, it's not about ego. And it's like, sure, I can, there's an ego impact, but there's like a human being here. And then what happens is the pilot asks you, should we divert? Which means like, is this person having a heart attack or are they having a panic attack? Do we need to land the plane right now and get them to the hospital? Or is this anxiety? So do I f up 200 people's day? Oh. Or do, I, do we land the plane? Yeah, save a life. Oh. Right? Yeah. And in that moment, like who the f cares whether I'm tall or short or rich or poor or whatever, right? It's about the, the substance of the thing. And so the, the key thing about like performance and metrics and all that kind of stuff, and we pay attention to that, we do a good job, right? But is that like, just remove ego from the equation. And, and I'm, I'm with Esther when she says like, what's the importance of likes? Money. The whole problem is that as long as you see likes as money, you're gonna be fine. The whole problem is when you start to see likes as more than money. When you start to equate your self-worth with your bank account. And so teasing apart that thing is the fundamental skill which will make that easy. You can still be ambitious, you can still work really hard, you can still do really well, but make it for like the right purpose instead of ego gratification because with ego gratification, no amount is ever enough. All, mm -hmm. yeah. What happens when like, so for me, it, it, this company, right? It would be great if all I, if it was just for me growing this and, and at whatever pace, fine. But now I'm responsible for 15, 30 other people that, you know, this, we have to generate a certain revenue a month and we have to grow. Now I have investors tied to it. Like there's, I'm responsible for the outcome of the employees, the investors, the stores, the, you know, everybody that depends on me. And it changes, I guess it kind of changed. Like, even though I feel a certain way about how it should be, I have to a lot of time put my feelings aside because I'm now responsible for a company, you know? So then at that point, it doesn't really matter what I feel. I have to, I have to perform. Do you get what I'm saying? Y yes and no, but that is a feeling. So I want you to really pay attention. Y'all, maybe y'all can help me out when he says, it doesn't matter what I feel. I have to perform. What do you think is going on in his brain? Um, right. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Do y'all see how there's a feeling there? Mm -hmm. there? There's a feeling of, I don't know if this there's is going to make sense. There's fear too. There's fear and there's a sense of response that what you mm -hmm. feel is responsible. That's an emotion, mm -hmm. bro. Mm-hmm. It's a feeling. The feeling that you have is my feelings don't matter. But that's a feeling. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to y'all? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So even now you're being controlled by a feeling. So let me, let me put it to you this way. Whether you are mentally responsible or not mentally responsible, in your head, the optimal performance of the company and your employees is still the same. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so if you were like a consultant for your company, the answers to let your company grow and do the best by your employees are going to, they're kind of dispassionate. You don't have to feel responsible to know what the right answer is to do. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. 
And so that's the problem is that you feel responsible, but whether you feel responsible or not doesn't change the fact of like, how do you make this company grow in a healthy and sustainable way? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's, you can look at that as a case in business school. And the answer is going to be the same. Mm -hmm. The whole problem is that now you feel responsible. Mm -hmm. So now your ego, now you don't want to let people down. Oh my God, Mm -hmm. I can't let these people down. Like, Oh wow. I didn't realize that you could control capitalism and markets and get people to buy your product. I didn't realize you had that ability of mind control, mm-hmm. right? So you, I know this sounds kind of insane, but I mean, there are things that you can do to improve your chances of success, but it's not within your hands mm-hmm. to determine whether your company is successful. Mm-hmm. Maybe some rat <laughs> will start a competitor, steal all your ideas, rip off your marketing, and will push you out of the market. There is, there is I, I, don't necessarily, there. I don't necessarily care about other people, like competition in that sense, but there is... I could hire the wrong person that all of a sudden brings down all my other team members. Then I don't, I mean, I've dealt with this personally, right? There are things in my control that have a drastic impact on the success of the company. How do you know who's the right person and the wrong person when you hire them? Uh, it's just kind of trial and error. Then why do you blame yourself for making a mistake if there's no way to know? Well, there is a way to know because it was like, as I got better at interviewing, as I made the errors, I've gotten better at it. And now I've, done a better job of bringing the right people in the, in the company. Great. So let's talk about the first person that you hired. Yeah. Could you have avoided that mistake? Yes, I think so. How? Uh, I think I could have leaned on people that had more experience and just been like, hey. When did you go. learn the lesson of leaning on people that oh, are more this experienced? Boy got you. <laughs> he, he got you. When did I learn the lesson? Oh, Go from ahead. that. From it. making oh, that. No, 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 no. You no, 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 no. You do. You do. No, no. This is this is brilliance. Go from, for it, bro. From from making that mistake, like. Fit? From He's that basically experience. saying like you had to go through that shit yeah, to of learn. Of course, of course. Right. So there's and, no avoiding it. Yeah. You yeah, would have so, made that so same so mistake you, down the road. Yeah. Right. So so you can't blame mis- yourself for the mistakes. And these of guys the past. in suits. They're onto me. I should have worn mine. Yeah. Right. So, so like, that, and, and I'm with you. Like, so I, I know what it's like to feel responsible mm, and I feel like you should have done better. Yeah. yeah. Right. And this is the, the hard lesson that you learn in, in medicine is like, you can train a lot, but you can't, you can't save a life. Like we don't have power over life and death. True. I never feel bad about like, there is bad feelings if it's like personal relationships that get ruined. But overall I am very great. Like older now, I'm very grateful for my failures because it, it's, where I learned the biggest lessons. Um, I actually want, this is a topic or area I wanted to get into. Can you explain the psychology of failure? What about it? All of it. So like, what is like, like, so it also was back on the other topic when you were basically like the popularity thing. You're like, there was probably something of younger you that wanted this. Right. And then when I think about a lot of ego and a lot of the things that we have to unlearn as adults comes from the inner child. Right. We hear that term a lot where things happen in your early childhood, his anger, right. Abusive father was extremely abusive father. Right. It's things from your childhood that then affected you in a certain way to, I have to be a man. You know, I want to be uh, I want adoration from people around me. For me, I'm still figuring that out, right? I'm perfect. Sure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but it always seems like it's the inner child. So like early on, it's like, I think there's a lot of impact of parents of when you failed and how they treated you. I think it's also society, like school of how it's treated. It's like you said, you were surrounded by medicine and doctors and going to Harvard met something. So I guess it's like, how would you, how would, how do you teach kids to like, how do you teach failure to your, your kids? I'd say like, yeah. So let's start with something really weird, which is that like failure is a abstraction of the human mind. It's not like a real thing. So I know that there's like F's on transcripts, but like, I, I don't know that well, crashing of, a car is a failure. You failed to drive the car properly. And now there's a, a result that, yeah, yeah. So, so you could, you could certainly say that. Right. So I, I, I know that's why it's kind of weird, but, um, there are certainly outcomes that you could consider failures, but if you sort of look at your responsibility, if there's a car crash, it doesn't necessarily mean that you made a mistake. Okay. Right? Yeah. So let's just start with that. We'll get into that a little bit later. So the second thing to understand is that we have a society that really, really punishes failure. So this is something that like, I remember the first F I got in college destroyed the chance of a 4.0 and it was the most painful F. Right. Like at this point, like, okay, if you want to be like, if you want to go to med school, it's like, it's competitive. You got to have like a three, seven, three, eight. Right. And like, if you want to really get it to to a good medical school, you need a 4.0. Like you have to, you have to be perfect. 
So we have a society that conditions us to never fail, which is why people cheat because you can't like afford to fail. And yet if we sort of stop and look at it, like failure is literally a part of life. Like, and so this is where I think it's so stupid that we punish people for failure. And so our, our, if we look at society, like we don't actually prioritize learning or growth or competence, even bizarrely, we don't prioritize competence. What we prioritize is a history of perfection. So this is wrong. Like, I just don't think that's how life is um, because everyone is going to fail at some point. And the real question is whether you learn from your failures or not. So learning from our failures as well as our successes is how we ultimately get to the, the best position. Mm -hmm. So when I was in, in med school and stuff, I started like tutoring people and I was like working with like med students who were like falling behind. And, and that's when I, like, I tried to explain to them that they're getting bent out of shape because they had an F. And this is where I would try to like explain to them, like y'all are completely missing the point. Like, I don't think you get this. One day you're going to be on a plane and someone is going to ask you, do we need to land the plane? This is why you should be studying the grades, mm. the prestige. Like at some point, someone will live or die depending on how you study. So this is what you should focus on. And in this way, if you get a question wrong, see, I, this is so stupid. It's the second that you finish a test, right? You study really hard before a test. You get like, let's say you get a B plus. You studied pretty hard. What do you do? You don't go and look at the questions that you missed. It's yeah. already on to the next thing. So we have, a, we have a society where really if we want kids to learn, what we should be doing is give you the test. You take a B plus. Let's spend one more week on that same material and let's have everyone learn the mistakes that you made. So this is what we try to do in medical training where like it's easy to forget. But the whole point of medical training is that by the, it's not where you start. Right. It's by the time you finish, everyone should be competent. But the way that our society is, it's like even in the first grade, there's like honors kid classes and non-honors classes. Mm -hmm. So we start separating everyone out based on their success or failure instead of getting everyone to a minimum mm -hmm. level of competence. The, so yeah. then how do you feel about like there's some people that are just more talented in, than others and you do need the honors because maybe that guy's just progressing faster and might as well let him. Like, I'm, I'm a strong believer of Montessori Waldorf. Like, let the, let the kids excel and do what they're great at instead of forcing me into math, which I was garbage at. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I would have been better off, happier, felt more purpose in life if I was able to just do things that I was good at. Right? What was it like to be forced into math? I was horrible. It well, was just... How so? I mean, I just couldn't get it. Like, it didn't matter how much time I spent. So I'll give you an example. I was in community college, so I'm older. I had to take pre-calc three times. Nice. Three times. Yeah. And, and the first time, it was like I wasn't really applying, and I understood stood why I failed. Because also, it was like the time that I had to sit down and study and understand a concept, I was like, this just sucks. This is wasting two, three hours of my day. So I failed, and I just kind of gave up. The second year, I was like, okay, I got to pass this because supposedly I need to be an econ major because that's how I get into college, right? I had some arbitrary idea because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to tutoring every single day for four to six hours. I, I studied pre-calc like I worked a job. There's only 24 hours. What? In a day. I said uh, four, four to six hours. Oh. Yeah, take that suit off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I studied really hard and I just got a different teacher. She was really intense. I got a D minus. So I failed again. Then the following year, my friend had the tests and I had the teacher that he had the test and I just cheated my way through. And I was like, great, I'm, I'm done with this. But it was like to put that much effort that second year and, and, and still, you know, there was the, the outcome of it. I was like, this was such, and, and also right when I checked out of that class, did not, when I had to take it the third year, I did not remember anything that I studied because it just didn't attach with my life. So, um, I guess that's the, the, the way of saying of like, uh, what was the original? What were we well, talking some about? people are just hold, better at things. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. So, so, like, so, you know, what, what just happened, right? So, Jeremy just shared something, and he's like, "What's the point? Doesn't yeah. matter what the point was. The, you just the point is that." Oh, right? honors so, classes versus whatever. I'm uh, like, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that. But, but, like, I, I just want everyone to kind of like appreciate for a second that, like, this is good, right? This is healthy. It's like you have to that that resentment. I don't know if y'all can feel it. Yeah. But the resentment. Hey, math. <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah. Right. Right. But like, I, I, I think that like we can all feel like the emotional energy of like being forced to fail like over and what I hear is like, I was bad at this and I tried everything. I, I did everything that I was supposed to do and it still wasn't enough. 
and it's so f***ed that you were made to feel so less than human, so stupid, so pathetic, such a f***ing dumbass. You're trying so hard, and then what do you have to show for it? Like a f***ing D minus, right? And, and like, just the hurt. Like, what I get from you is, like, raw. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, so... I go back and forth on this, right? Because there's, I, I agree with you. There's some stuff where I'm like, that, that sucks, right? But the other part of my life is there's some things that I just had to tough out even though I was like, this sucks and I'm bad at it now, but I know it's going to be healthy for me later, right? Getting up, like I, I used to be a lot more disciplined, like, you know, reading. I hated reading. No, I didn't hate it. I just had to find the right books, right? But even then, right, it's difficult for me to, because I was so addicted to my, I just had like, pick up my phone or just get distracted with the littlest thing. I had to teach myself how to put my phone in another room, set a timer and read for that period of time. And over time it got easier. And now I reap all the benefits of it. Right. Or there's things that I do in my business that I don't want to do, but I know, I know that it's good for me. Right. So, and it's paid off. Right. So I have this balance sometimes because a lot of people are like, oh, you should just not do what you don't want to do. But I'm like, sometimes though, people have no level of accountability or discipline where I'm like, maybe you should just tough it out and suffer through it a little bit because you will, you will get some kind of outcome on the other end. You know, maybe I hated pre-calc and doing that every day, but I was like, damn, I put a lot of effort into that. Like, let me try to do the same thing for something that I enjoy this time around and see what that outcome could be. But you know, I didn't know that I could put myself through that kind of like pain so, and come out the other side, you know, let me jump in. So there's a couple yeah. of different threads here. So let's, let's start with so what's the difference? So what I'm kind of hearing is almost like a question, which is mm -hmm. like, when do I know when I should force myself to do something? And when is it because this is just all part of a, you know, I need to get an A and, or I need a pre to be economics mm -hmm. and I don't even give a shit about any of that anyway. So I think there are a couple of important things to understand. So you should tough things out when it's something that you want. Mm -hmm. And when it's something that you have been conditioned to want or is a part of your ego, which is basically the same thing, then it's not worth it. It's never going to end well. That's good. Right? So, so this is where, and this is the problem with social media. If we really look at life today, our attention, literally what our mind is looking at for the majority of the day is outside of us. So I used to be one of these like uber efficient people where I would wake up in the morning. I'm like listening to a podcast mm -hmm. while I'm like taking a shit, right? <laughs> and then like when I'm cooking, I'm like listening to lectures and I'm, I have like, you know, earbuds in when I'm walking to the train, I'm like studying on the train, like I'm reading, like every moment, like I want to be efficient. But if you really look at what's going on in my mind, my mind is never looking in here. It's always looking to the outside. And so then what happens is once we get disconnected from ourselves, because if we don't look at what's in here, we don't know what we want. Then we feel directionless because we have no guiding in here. So if you sort of look at like, what is the guiding for human beings? It's this, a child, even an infant knows when they're hungry and they know when they're thirsty, they know when, you know, they know these things. An infant knows this because we get signals internally about what feels right and what feels wrong. And then over time, what happens if we do something like play video games, those signals get suppressed because our attention is so drawn outside of ourselves that we're looking to the outside world. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to things like TikTok and stuff like that, our attention is drawn outside of us, outside of us, outside of us. So when we disconnect from ourselves, we, get, we don't see our internal signals. Then what happens is if, we, if I wake up and like I'm, you know, I'm 22, let's say, and like I don't know what I want in life. Right. So I don't know. Should I major in this? Should I major in that? And then what do we come up with? We come with arbitrary answers like I need to study economics. Where the f did that answer come from? <laughs> it came from you watching something or talking to some guy, some person, some success guru on the Internet said this is what you should do to be successful because you don't know in here. And then you listen to this person's advice and you listen to this person's advice. And on the one hand, then things get very confusing. Should I struggle and be disciplined and fail or should I'm confused? Is failure a good thing? Is it not a good thing? And so we get really confused and then we go to these outside sources of information because we don't know the answer. So let me go talk to the smartest guy on the planet because he'll give me the answer, <laughs> right? And so we go to these different people, they give us answers and then we try to apply them to their life, but they don't work 100%. Why not? Because that's the answer that worked for that guy's life. I'm a different human being. 
And so even if we listen to you and what you said, very clear difference about when you should be disciplined and when it's okay to cheat is who is the person giving a shit? Are you giving a shit in here or are you trying to conform to what society wants you to do? Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to Asian kids, our parents are so big on conformity, right? You need to be like this kid and like you got a and you're second in the class and this kid down the street, little Timmy down the street is first in the class and you should be more Fuck like him. Timmy. Yeah, right? You should be more like this. You shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be like this. Asian parents never ask, who are you? That's a completely foreign question. That's a bar. Right? I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> no, it was good. It was good. <laughs> good line. Powerful yeah, right? line. Powerful line. Like, they never ask us, who do you want to be? They are so quick to tell us this is who you should be. Okay, on that... There's a lot of things I hated that my parents did that they forced me in that I appreciate that I'm older because I understand like what they were trying to do overall. Maybe the, the way they taught it wasn't the greatest. But for example, right, when they, when my dad cut me off of World of Warcraft, cut my subscription, I hated him for that, but it was the best thing that he could have ever done for me, right? And, and I appreciate him for that. I'm like, I'm glad that he didn't say, oh, you love video games? Okay, that's who you think you are? Play video games all day, right? I'm glad that he was kind of like... Yo, tough I love. just know, yeah, tough love. Mm -hmm. I just know that this shit is poisonous for you and I'm seeing that you're waking, staying up all night, 6 a.m., you're sneaking out to play video games. Like, this is not good for you. Loser. I mean, he, he didn't say it in that calm manner, right? I, I, and again, the lesson could have been taught better, but as I got older, I'm like, I'm so glad that I didn't get stuck playing that game, you know? Yeah. I mean, so I, I think that that's, so even then, I think that that's good parenting. I mean, it sounds like you could have done better at it, but yeah. I think the big thing there is even if you pay attention to your words, you, he said, this is poisonous for you. I know. And he never said that. He was just like, what the f You're up yeah. at 6 a.m. What the f are you doing? And then he cut that shit. He's like, you're not playing this anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so if it's, if it's good, great. Yeah. Right. But I, I think the more that parents try to do what's right for their kids, mm -hmm. right? So the, the problem is that like, so I think being a good parent is when you do what's right for your kid. I think a bad parent is someone who tries to make your kid into some, some other kid, person's kid. Mm. Right? So really, and, and, and that's where, like, I, I, know, I mean, I, I don't know if you all have kids. I'm assuming not, but no. you, you never know. Um, and, and so I, I think that's kind of what it comes down to, right? Is like understanding. So from a parent's standpoint, well, here I am sort of telling you all that, like, if you want to be, like, happy and successful, and this is the crazy thing is everyone assumes that in order to be successful, you have to sacrifice happiness. I think it's, like, completely. You don't need to do that. You just need to know how to do both. And if it comes to something like, you know, the more centered you are in yourself, and I think Esther stumbled into it where she's like, I edit less. So even she figured out that the less I edit, the better I feel about myself. And so there are other things that we can do to once we start developing like confidence in who we are, which can still be a failure. Like you can wake up one day and you can say, I suck at this. And like, that's okay. Why would I expect that I should be good at this? Maybe you have a brain that's not very good at pre-calculus. That's okay. Then the question becomes, okay, even with this brain that's not good at pre-calculus, this does not make me a good human or a bad human. Then the question becomes, do I want to learn pre-calculus? Do I need to learn pre-calculus? And this is where we get to the stuff where you say, it's good for me to be disciplined. I had to do it hard because it's coming from in here. The basic problem in the world today is that Everyone is telling us to do something, but they're telling us from the outside, you should be this, you should be this, you should be this. It started with the parents and social media is like the mother of all Asian parents. It's like the epitome of you should be something else. Why can't you be like this person who uses a filter, right? <laughs> and so the problem is still the same. And it's just, we become disconnected from ourselves because we literally don't spend time with ourselves. What if, so then... How, how do you deal with people that are like complacent with things that aren't necessarily healthy for them? Right. Like, cause, and then, and then they truly, or, or have you seen in your work, you're like, if you dig into someone's true heart of what they really want, most times that's not actually what they want. Like, for example, if someone is like, um, uh, I'll use an example. I used to have a friend that was just very comfortable smoking weed all day. Right. And that's just, She's just like, that's me. I'm happy with this. But over time, I could tell that he was unhappy because we were all progressing in life and he wasn't moving forward, right? But then he, at that point, the addiction was too strong, right? So we had to learn the hard way where it was just like, it's bad for you. Cut it out. Like, you got to go to rehab, things like that. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess my question is like, 
how do you know if that's genuine versus someone just being complacent in their life? Okay, so a great question. I'm going to like try to tease it apart in a couple ways. So one is like, let's understand the difference between complacency and contentment. Mm -hmm. Um, And the second thing is like, see, when someone's in denial, the more true something is, the harder they push back. So when I work with people who are addicted, and this was kind of my case too, is like, if people told me I had a problem with gaming, I knew they were right. The problem is that I didn't know what to do about it. So then the more they came at me and they're like, bro, this is fucked. I was like, no, you're wrong. Because if I ever admit to them, I know deep down, and this is what confuses parents a lot, by the way, is that the more right you are about your kid, if they know it, they know it too. It's just, they don't know how to, they don't know a road forward. So in my mind, what's going on is if I have an unsolvable problem, because believe you me, like, you know, I, I tried to stop playing video games. I just couldn't control it. I knew that like I should be going to class. I knew that I should be doing homework. I knew all of these things. And there's a part of me that wanted to do all those things, but I couldn't control it. And so now if you look at my psychology in that moment, if I'm faced with an unsolvable problem, if I admit that there's an unsolvable problem, then I'm just right. 100%. So then my mind has an option, which is that I can be in denial denial. And if there's an unsolvable problem then I'm hundred percent, but if it's not a real problem, then I've got a chance at not being. So we go into denial. And the worse things are, the harder we deny stuff. Right? And then, like, sometimes we can get strong-armed into rehab, which, like, I, I ran a couple of rehabs for, like, a year. And so these are, like, 30-day rehabs where people will come. And, like, people would force, you know, people get forced into, bullied into rehab all the time. It doesn't work. Hmm. The reason it doesn't work is because... You know, you can't be sober for someone else. They have to want to be sober for it to work. And so then the question kind of becomes like, okay, if someone is like pretending that they're complacent, which a lot of potheads do, and this is the other problem is if you look at especially something like marijuana or substances, the part of you that is unhappy with your life, the centers of your brain, which are your amygdala and your limbic system, those centers of your brain are literally being shut off by the marijuana. That's why we use it, right? So Mm. like my life is a mess. I have anxiety. Like this is a problem. This is a problem. But the moment that I get high, like literally all those problems go away. Now I'm just straight chilling, (laughs) right? We're just vibing. We're just chilling. And so now like we've got an interesting problem, which is that the weed is not the problem. The weed is the solution. So I'm going nowhere in your your friend's case. All y'all are leaving him behind. And he's like, oh, I'm falling behind in life until I get high. Then everything's fine. Now it's like, who the f- cares if I'm behind? We're just chilling. So this is kind of the problem that we see, especially with addictions, is that they suppress the parts of our brain that are giving us warning signals. And the problem is that if we stop suppressing them, the warning signals come in and we don't like that. And we don't know how to deal with anxiety. Like, how are you supposed to solve this problem without the weed? If the kid had ever been taught how to fix this problem, how to manage anxiety, and this is where he comes full circle back to Vit, right? Where he feels something and he needs to do something. Beat up a 12-year-old to make this feel better, (laughs) right? So the basic problem, the basic skill that we're lacking is that we are unable to deal with things on the inside. Damn. And the moment that you are able to conquer your fear... Fear is not something to be afraid of. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, If mm -hmm. I can't control my fear, then I have to avoid the things that make me fearful. And so then I start avoiding life because if life gets hard, I can't deal with it. So the whole point is learn how to conquer this. Like fear is nothing to be afraid of. It's just. What is your number one tactic of getting over fear? Um, well, number one, belly rubs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I, I think there isn't one tactic. So I have an approach. So one is that a lot of the emotions that we experience are carried over from past experiences. Mm-hmm. So if we kind of think about like it, relationship baggage, what does that mean to have relationship baggage? That means you have bad emotions from the last relationship that show up in this relationship. So past actions past emotions that our brain suppresses need to be metabolized and then things become way easier. So if you, even if you look at like, like literally, like let's say I have a phobia of snakes because I got bit by a snake. So if you look at that, what happens is 
when I see a snake today, the amount of fear that I experience is disproportionate to the stimulus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what's happening is I have all of that fear from the past traumatic experience, which activates now and makes this experience feel really like scary. Mm -hmm. So you can go back in time and, and through things like psychotherapy or meditation, or there's all kinds, you can even go for long walks. You can stare at a wall for an hour and it's amazing. If you guys want a simple practice, just stare at a wall for an hour and just do nothing. All kinds of thoughts and it'll start with boredom. You'll get antsy and then weird will start to come up because mm -hmm. we have so much built in there. You don't even need to meditate anymore. You just stare at a wall for an hour and just see what happens. So old fears will come up. Those can be metabolized as we metabolize those. Then we're just dealing with the fear from today. We're not dealing from the fear from like all the past. Second thing that you can do is an emotional regulation technique. So you can learn to accept fear. You can also learn to like do things like there's one technique called Nadi Shuddhi Pranayam which is like a meditation technique where you breathe out of each nostril alternately. And that does certain things to your nervous system. So when we feel fear, our sympathetic nervous system, our adrenaline, our cortisol, all of these skyrocket. And all of these hormones will literally activate the parts of our brain in which we experience fear. So we can do certain practices that will shut off that part of the nervous system, decrease our adrenaline levels, decrease our cortisol levels, and literally what will happen is the amount of fear that you experience will decrease. Physiologically, it's, it'll be just like pot. The problem is that like that's harder to do and you have yep. to train yourself to do it. So if you practice meditation on a daily basis, fear, it's not that fear goes away, it's that fear just bothers you less. You're like okay with it, right? It's like on a roller coaster, you're afraid, but you're okay with it. Mm -hmm. You even choose to do it sometimes. Mm -hmm. By now, you've seen us drink this beautiful drink, and this is Nectar Hard Seltzer, the first Asian-inspired hard seltzer featuring delicious flavors like Asian pear, lychee, mandarin, and yuzu. Now, unlike all those big brands out there that have the disgusting aftertaste, we got rid of it. There is no weird aftertaste in this. We actually started Nectar two years ago out of my garage, and because of a viral TikTok, we took off. And because of supporters like you, we've now expanded Nectar into five states, California, Hawaii, Washington, New York, and New Jersey. If you'd like to get a box of Nectar, here are four easy options to choose from. Go to our website, NectarHardSeltzer.com, click on the store locator, and the store closest to you will pop right up. If we're not in any stores near you, next time you're in your favorite store, ask the manager to stock us. You'll be genuinely surprised how well that works. Works. And if we're not in any stores near you yet, or we're not in your city, you can order us online. We ship to 45 states. And if we can't ship to you, send us a text that tells us where we need to go next. Drink Nectar Hard Seltzer, unique Asian flavors, and no weird aftertaste. Now back to whatever the hell they're talking about. What about, uh, for me, I think uh, a big thing that helped me get over a lot of fear was just kind of doing hard things. Because then it's like, okay... And, and a hard thing could be, okay, uh, I don't like talking to women, but I'll get comfortable talking to strangers first. How do you feel about like putting people in environments where, mm. you know, because a, a sense of accomplishment, it suddenly mutes it where you're like, oh, maybe your, your fear is like, oh, if I talk to a random person, they're going to hate me. And then you start talking to people on the bus and you're like, you know what? Everyone's nice. The world isn't actually as scary as it is. You know, uh, how do you feel about like using, doing hard things as a way to get over fear? I think it's great if you can do it. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is, go ahead. Yeah, what's that quote where they were like, you have to do things that make you uncomfortable to grow or something like that? Do you, is that, is that? I, I mean, I think good? it's one way to grow. Like I think force the, yourself to do something. The, 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 the reality of it is like, so Vid asked you earlier, right? Why don't you just post a picture of yourself as a joke? Like mm -hmm. he can do that and it mm -hmm. may be harder for you. So I think it's very good to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation that you can tolerate. I think the real challenge is for a lot of people, they're unable to do that. Mm. What's the psychology behind trying to make every situation uncomfortable? Uh, what do you mean by that? I have a problem where I try to make things as awkward as I can. Yeah, okay, so I'll tell you. It's not psychology, it's neuroscience. So you are comfortable. Yeah. You are uncomfortable with peace. Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> right? So if we look at your upbringing, uh -huh. and there are some moments in the podcast that we can go back to and pay attention to your face because we hit a nerve once or twice, so I'm going to be careful here. So like, if we look at your upbringing, your baseline mode of survival was high adrenaline. Absolutely, yeah. Right? So like, 
he, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but like when it, when I when a child is thrown in the ocean every day, the child learns how to swim. The child feels comfortable in the ocean, even though like the ocean is a scary place. That's also my philosophy. Not to cut you off, but that's also my philosophy for trying new things. Is I literally so I taught myself how to swim, and I literally like threw myself into the deep end. Yeah, we're getting to that. Yeah, yeah. So that right, because okay. so like if we look at it, so your your physio the baseline state of your physiology when you were growing up as a child was oh. Mm -hmm. So now what happens is like what you're comfortable with, what you understand is oh shit. And so if we're sitting around here and we're like, oh, Vit, like you're such a great guy, bro. He's, what is he going to do? He's going to start making jokes. I'm going to be <laughs> extremely uncomfortable, yes. You're going to be extremely uncomfortable. But yeah. if you can activate the adrenaline in your body, now you're like, okay, I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. It's like the tranquil waters that make you deeply uncomfortable. Absolutely, yeah. And so if I ever say anything authentically nice to you, like I think you're a brave human being and I'm so sad that like you had to live this I life. I would immediately shut down. Right? Like it's like, scary like can mm -hmm. you feel it right now like how do you feel yeah like a little more tense right for sure, yeah. like this is making you uncomfortable because i can see that you've suffered and yeah. you're like i don't know what to do like get me out of here yeah right that's like you with girls you know how like you don't want them to be lovey-dovey oh yeah. yeah yeah so so then you're gonna do shit, like you're gonna create drama you're gonna create all kinds of problems or in your life them. because yeah. The, the house burning down is the only environment that you know how to succeed. There's a very good quote where I, I love quotes. I live my life by quotes. And there's a there's a certain graphic and a quote that really spoke to me. And it's like my childhood house burned down and the kid that I was in it. Yeah. I love that quote. But it's like I'm, a, I'm also trying to remedy it. But. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, the reason you sow chaos around you is because that's the environment that you know how to survive. You don't know. Yeah. And, and like, if we kind of even go into in a little bit more detail, see, like, when you have a traumatic parent, it's super scary because I'm sure that your it sounds like your dad was abusive. Yeah, I would basically be every day. Yeah, and so did your, was your dad ever nice to you? If he was, I don't remember. So, like, chances are your dad was sometimes nice to you. Probably, yeah. Right? But the thing is, if you look at a child who gets beat every day and their dad is nice to them, like that confuses the hell out of the child. Absolutely. Because yeah. when you were probably two, there you were like, oh, thank God. That was just a one-time thing. And then he's nice to you because he feels guilty. Yeah. And then he goes and he apologizes. He gets you a gift. He says, I'm so sorry. I love you so much. Daddy's never going to do it again. And then he does it again. And so even that tranquility starts to become a mask for something like terrible on the other side. Hmm. right because you learned deep 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 down that even safety like you cannot trust safety bro yeah like you're gonna get absolutely the only thing you can do is keep your guard up and f try to survive hmm. because if you ever let your guard down you're gonna get hurt yeah that that is I, I would say i'm better at it now uh through these last two years but that that was definitely my mindset my, my mindset has always been me against the world absolutely like, i'm always assuming people are out to get me which yeah. is i think why i play that little character like everybody hates vit trap like i make a joke out of it but for sure that's what my mind is like yeah because i mean because if you think about it who is the world when you're a kid it's your parents yeah so uh, mm -hmm. it, it's vit against the world it's not vit against the world it's the world against you bro yeah and that's the reality it's not like some it's not a figment of your imagination it's your it's your wiring you were saying the other day, you were like, that's the only way that I could operate. That's what fuels me. You're like, yeah. I, this is the best mentality I can be. I would love his perspective of how to get you out of that mentality. Oh, I would also love that. Yeah. yeah so, what? Um, so oh, oh, real, real quick, how much time do we have? Just so I can also, because there's 30. 30? Oh, great. Great, great. So basically my, uh, yeah, tragic upbringing. Um, what, I, what I learned in my teenage years was... Basically, when I ran away at 17, mm -hmm. that was when I felt like I finally did something for myself. That's when I got into this, this mindset of like, I have to be like this. I have to go against the world. Everybody's against me. And I have to conquer the world to, to prove to myself and to everyone else, this is how I know I'm safe. This is how I know I can do something with my life. But with that mindset, it comes with, like, I mean, like, like I said, like I'm against the world. Whenever I want to excel in life my mindset goes back a couple years to that teenage mindset where it's i have to 
like I I use like uh, uh, anger and and almost like desperation as as fuel because that's the only time in my life where I felt like I did something. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a great point. So like we we just filmed a guide to trauma where I mm. think you should absolutely watch it. I I would love to. Yeah. So let's understand a couple things. So when you grow up in an unhealthy environment, you have to compensate in order to survive or excel. Mm -hmm. So like then what happens is that you learn that this compensation is the way to find balance. So if I'm at like a negative 100, I have to amp things up by 100 points to get back to zero. And then once you leave the traumatic environment, the only thing that you, what you equate with moving forward is amping things up to 100. So then what happens is if you're at zero, you don't, it's not, doesn't work because you kind of like feel like I have to amp things up to plus 100. Absolutely, yeah. So, so the problem with that, that mentality is that on the one hand, if you are at negative 100, you'll be able to move forward because that compensation works. Mm -hmm. So what we see in trauma is that an adaptation becomes a maladaptation. So the lack of trust for another human being, the inability to be intimate, the inability to be vulnerable is a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. But if you ever want to get into a, a meaningful romantic relationship, that thing that allowed you to survive back then makes it impossible for you to succeed today. Absolutely. Yep. And then on the flip side, what also happens is that people learn how, what they need to do to themselves to accomplish their goals. So in your case, you have to have this us versus the world mentality to bring out your motivation. Yep. There are also people who have to beat themselves up in order to progress. I'd, I'd literally be in the shower punching myself, yeah. Right? So we see this too where it's like... Uh, yeah, you that's know, my motivation in the morning. I'll play like heavy and just scream yeah, so, so, music so and there's punch a, myself. There's other things going on there, but, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that. But I, I want you all to sort of think about like, you know, let's say the kid who's got a 4.0. Like the kid who's got a 4.0, here we are looking at that kid and thinking, oh man, I wish I had that, that, that person's straight chilling all the time. But that person is beating themselves up constantly, right? So they're like, a 4.0 is not enough. Like, yeah. I need to do better, I need to do better, I need to do better. And if we sort of look at the adaptive value of that, if I beat myself up for getting a 3.9, that will result in a 4.0, right? So beating myself up, no matter how good I do, is actually adaptive for success, we see this with, with content creators. I'm sure that however well your podcast does, it's not good enough. We can never celebrate. Absolutely. We can maybe celebrate for a day, but we've got to do better. We've got to do better. We've got to mm -hmm. do better. So this is where like we, we use all of these tricks in the mind or our mind makes all these adaptations to help us move forward. Mm -hmm. And the process of getting around that is like tricky. So the first thing that you can do is just observe what happens. Right, so notice all of these patterns within your mind. And there's some weird neuroscience here, but even observing a pattern is enough to break it. You don't actually need to use willpower or discipline. Enough observation of the thing will actually cause the pattern to melt away. Hmm. So if we look at habits, so what we're talking about here is we could say that Vit has a bad set of habits, fair enough? Yeah. So if we look at habit, is a habit something that is intentional or automatic? Automatic. Feels automatic. 100%. So y there's no such thing as an intentional habit. The, the habits are an, the endocannabinoid circuitry in the brain. They're, they're a completely different part of the brain. So the moment that we start utilizing an awareness, um, a habit disappears. And there's a really great example to do uh, that you all can experience, which is everyone knows how to walk, but try to control every muscle in your body to create walking. Try to intentionally walk and it'll become impossible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, first I got to lift this foot. Then I got to move yeah, my ankle. Yeah. Then I got to do this. Then I got walking becomes impossible. So the, there's another beautiful, simple thing that people can do at home. So you all want to try something? What's up? Yes. Okay. So close your eyes. Observe your breath. So the moment that you observe your breath, you're controlling it. You guys see that? Stop mm -hmm. controlling your breath and let it be natural. 
Does this kind of make sense? Like it's going to be impossible to do as long as you are observing it. Mm -hmm. You start to control what comes in and what comes out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and everyone's like, okay, how do I break a bad habit with like willpower discipline? No, no. All you need is observation. I challenge y'all to try to observe your breath without affecting it at all. It's going to be impossible. Yeah. So if we, if you just observe your pattern. So what I would say is if you hit yourself in the shower every morning, not every morning. <laughs> I'm not that far gone yet. Um, so, so if you just, whatever it is, even your desire to listen to loud music, what is it? So you feel the itch. I want loud music. Mm. Hold on a second. Close your eyes for a second. Where is this itch coming from? Then listen to the loud music. How do I feel listening to the loud music? Did the loud music work? Did it not work? What is the effect on me? Just watch yourself. Mm. And these patterns will start to melt away. There are other things that you can also do, like therapy goes a long way. Um, Uh, And, but also like even things like rewiring your physiology. So you need to start being more comfortable with like a non-adrenaline kind of thing. Mm. Right. So like even when I was rubbing your tummy earlier, like it's kind (laughs) of adrenaline oriented, right? This stranger is rubbing my tummy. It's like kind of uncomfortable. So I'm totally cool with it. Like it's totally fine. (laughs) And, and so just, it's going to be weird, but peace will be scary to you. Yeah. And so then what you have to do is just practice being peaceful. Right. So recognize, okay, like I'm going to be scared. And this is what's going to be kind of weird now if we really want to get into it is as you become peaceful, you will discover that there is a terrified child like deep within you. That's just scared. I was was just about to say, whenever I try to be peaceful, it never ends in peace. So what is your experience when you try to be peaceful? If I try to be peaceful, if I set aside a day where I literally don't do anything or it's like I'm doing stuff I enjoy, blah, 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 peace, whatever always ends in anger. Right. Because then childhood shit comes up. Yeah. Then it, it's, it's a cycle where it's like once the childhood shit comes up, then I need to do this. If I don't do this, if I don't focus on improving my life, then I'm going to fly back to Iowa. I'm going to buy a gun. I'm going to shoot my dad. All right. So there's a lot of scary stuff there, right? And yeah. this comes back to the same thing. We actually discovered this with your FIFA, which is that when you feel something in here, yeah. You feel angry. You need to go do something. Yeah. So you just can't sit. It's the same. So I'll tell you, if you want to fix this completely, play a game of FIFA, get ratted, and say, good job, bro. <laughs> if you can ever do that, this problem will be fixed. We'll do, I, don't, I don't know if that's possible, but we'll see. <laughs> right? So, so it's just understanding that, okay, I have these feelings that I'm moving towards the outside world to try to fix this thing inside me, but you're going to need, I think some help would go a long way Yeah. where, where you need, ideally you'll find someone who's going to be able to sit with you and be able to manage a small amount of that anger without reacting to it. Mm -hmm. And the more of that, that you can do, there's a, there's a lot of anger stored. That's the other, the reason it's so impossible is you're not bad at it. You're great at it, by the way. Thank you. The, The reason it's so hard is because there's years of it built up. Right. So if I like if I go into a hoarder's house, a hoarder's house is hard to clean because there's years of shit piled up. Mm-hmm. That's the challenge with trauma is we have years of this stuff piled up. And every time something bad happens to you, you store it away. You stick it in the closet to deal with later. Yep. So it's going to take some time, but absolutely doable. Fascinating stuff. The, the, the awareness thing for my phone is kind of difficult. So I have one sec that, the okay. app on here. And basically, it's like if I want to open up Instagram, it will make me breathe. It's literally like there's a graphic. It's like breathe in, breathe out, or it's a dot that I have to hold to make you stop for that one second and be like, do you actually want to do this action? And sometimes I'm so addicted to this thing that I'll be like, I know that I don't want to do it, but I'm like, I'm just going to get through this lock. And so like, that's that's my issue. So uh, even though I'm aware, I'll still be like, nah, f- it. I'm not doing shit right now. My, It's not a waste of my time. I, I'll break through it. So like in that situation, what would you recommend? I think, uh, you just went from child abuse to phones, <laughs> just the addiction thing. I'm like, the awareness thing is so true. It's like the phone here, like I've blocked all my, you know, there's a lot of like notific, like this to me is one of the most poisonous devices for. Yeah. For- so, so, so I, I think in that situation, the battle has been lost. Mm. Right. So let's understand something. The first is one sec is great because if you look at it, what are, oh, sorry, what are, um, what are phone designers trying to do? So if you look at things like face ID, they're trying to reduce the time from impulse to engagement. Mm. See, when I was in college, this is like early two thousands, pre smartphone. 
if I got distracted, I only lost like 15 minutes because I'm sitting at the library, my mind wanders for a little while, and then eventually I'm like, oh, shit, I'm supposed to be studying. The problem in today's world is if you have a small impulse, you have Face ID, you log on to TikTok, and then you're scrolling. So even a temporary distraction, you lose like four hours. <laughs> so this is where I think, I think once like the stage is set and you're on the field of battle, and you can even tell, uh, I'll even like kind of break it down for you because you say there's anger when one shows up, right? Like, and so once you have that anger of like, Fuck it, like this thing is so annoying, your brain is, your brain's negative emotions are active. And once the negative emotions are active, you're gonna crave the device more. Mm. Because TikTok is gonna make that go away, right? It's gonna give you that relief, it's gonna give you that dopamine. So I'd say that this is where, yeah, go ahead. So is it bad? What? Is this app bad? No, 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 One that's not no, bad. No. Okay, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think good. the app is bad, but, but yeah. I'm just no, noticing that there are times, uh -huh. so if we look at the app, the app isn't the problem, uh -huh. but if we look at Jeremy, there are times where the app causes his mind to react in the right way, which is like, hold on a second, I don't want to do this. And there are times where his mind reacts in the wrong way, just like this app. Mm -hmm. So if we look at, it's not the app that's good or bad, it's his brain mm -hmm. that is in the right frame of mind or the wrong frame of mind. So if you really want to conquer this problem completely, it's fixing things up here. And that is tricky, but I would yeah. say like, you know, the simple things like one sec just isn't enough. So one of the things that I tend to do is like, I don't carry my phone around with me. So like mm. what I'll do is like, I'll keep my phone in my backpack. Um, even when I go to sleep at night, like I'll keep my phone at the opposite end of the, the room. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things to understand is that the more that you can increase the time between impulse and action, the better off you'll be. Mm. I like that. So super helpful. If you look at the, and people are making so much money on this. So it used to be that if you wanted to trade a stock, you had to do it during the stock exchange hours. Mm -hmm. Now what's happened with these trading apps and like sports betting and trading is getting, it's a Same. real ep epidemic. And the reason is because they wait until your frontal lobes are exhausted till two in the morning. So like at two in the morning, like you can't eat a salad, right? You got to have a burger, you got to get Uber Eats or whatever. And, and so when our brains are exhausted and we have this impulse, we start trading. And now this is really causing people huge consequences because they're like YOLOing, right? Like I'm going to buy this stock and it's two in the morning, get like, and so if we really look at it, the, the way that technology is really screwing us is that they're making it easy for us to capitalize on our impulses. Look at any shopping app. Oh, like you can just click a button. Buy TikTok with one shop click. shop is nuts. Buy with one click, right? Like, and, and just, just uh, oh, like just look. Wink at me and you've purchased the thing. <laughs> so, so the easier that they make it for impulses to result in action, the harder things are going to be for oh, you. God. So what we want to do is stretch out that time. And also you can train your brain. Right. So as we do things like meditation, our ability to restrain our impulses will improve. Mm, amazing. Super actionable. Damn. I want to hop over to relationships because I okay. think you have some really interesting topics around there. Um, so three years ago, you talked about how our brains are essentially going through like an industrial revolution type evolution through technology. And you were basically talking about how it affects the ability to form relationships. Um, can you first explain? Yeah, let's start there. Do you remember that video I'm talking about? It's like one of your top I, videos. I, I, oh, is it? Okay, well, we'll keep going. But. Yeah, and, and basically how it affects relationships. And um, do you remember that? So, so I, I think it's, it's good. Go ahead and, and just give us some context. Yeah, you're, you're basically saying how the reason why, like when you, you were talking about how client, like I think the example was you had a client that had been addicted to, to the point where he was like, oh, I don't have a full. And you're like, what's a full? And then you just turned out that he was just watching and saw the fake they had yeah. to the point where he tricked himself thinking that because he didn't come a certain amount, <laughs> you know, he wasn't having a full. Yeah. And then you went on in that video and you basically talked about how, uh, how like can affect your ability, like all kinds of issues that stem from the addiction. And then how you were, you were like when AI comes along and they figure out haptics to video, that's going to be a real problem. And I'm curious cause that video was like three years ago. What is your, like, did a lot of your predictions come true? Like, what are you kind of seeing of the landscape of the effect of the internet to people and their relationships? Oh, I mean, I, I think my predictions have come scarily true, but we haven't even gotten to the super scary stuff. We'll see if that actually happens. 
So let's just understand a couple of things about in relationships. So before we even get to let's, so I've worked with some people who are workers. And so if you look at the, the brain, so I was trying to understand which part of the brain controls. And it turns out that the whole brain controls. So like every neurotransmitter is involved in every region of the brain is involved in. So if we sort of think about, right, there's like emotional bonding, there's auditory stimuli, there's visual stimuli, there's thinking, there's like planning, there's recklessness, there's dopamine, there's emotions. Every part of our brain is involved in. So generally speaking, this is okay. Because if I have a normal relationship in which I have a normal encounter, we're supposed to do things like emotionally bond. So when, after we have, oftentimes people will cuddle. And when they cuddle, we get this, this hormone that's released called oxytocin. And oxytocin forms bonds between human beings. So there are even, uh, if you look at like infant maternal bonding, it's triggered by oxytocin. Um, this is also why they'll, they'll tell even like dads to do something called skin on skin, mm. which is we'll have dads like take off their shirt and then we'll have the kid like lay on you w w when they absorb heat from your body and stuff like that. That's why every time I see people, newborn babies, the dad's in the hospital bed shirtless. Yeah. I was like, well, why is their shirt always off? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that makes so, sense. So, so it facilitates bonding. And the other thing is that the skin of an infant is so thin mm. that they literally, they can't heat themselves. So they absorb your body heat. So the, the temperature of the child will be like the same temperature as, as whatever mm. they're touching. Mm. So this facilitates bonding. Um, and then, but then what, what happens, like, let's take the, the uh, sex worker. So what happens with a sex worker is that they have a physical relationship, but they're trying to not bond, right? So now what they're trying to do is actively shut off oxytocin because the whole point is we don't want to form bonds. Mm -hmm. And then their brain adapts. Our brain figures that out. And so then our brain is like, okay, and bonding are no longer related. And then what happens is now we've severed these two circuits and then they enter into a romantic relationship and they have difficulty forming bonds because sometimes it has to do with it and sometimes it doesn't. Thankfully, most of them will eventually get there. The point here is that when you have a incomplete romantic interaction, it's going to sever some, some parts of your brain. And, and not like literally, but just like yeah. it disconnects things. So when we look at, we sort of see the same thing kind of happen. Whereas like sometimes we can do all kinds of things like create unrealistic expectations, um, create a lot of things like dysmorphia and stuff like that because you have all these people with like really big and then everyone thinks like, oh my God, like, you know, there's all kinds of statistics that people don't realize. So this is kind yeah. of staggering. What do y'all think is the average amount of time that, what is the average time for a sexual act? I would, I would think like, this is penetration, right? Not like sure. Okay. Of course. Okay. Is five to ten minutes? Okay. What do y'all think? The yeah, average maybe. amount probably like seven minutes. This depends on how much I like her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is so, it? So it's three to seven minutes. So mm -hmm. at what time does the average woman start to think that this has gone on long enough? God. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes max. <laughs> Me and a woman thinking just... Me. 10 to 15. Really? Oh. So here's all... There's a generation of people that are like, I'm supposed to rail her all night. Uh -huh. And it's like, if you actually <laughs> ask women, they're like, 10 to 15 minutes is like too much. Yeah. The average act is like three to seven minutes. That's enough. <laughs> right? So we have all of these distorted ideas about... And the example that we're talking about is I, I had a, a patient who was saying like, you know, I, I can't achieve full... And I was like, what do you mean? So for a long time, I was like medically like approaching him and I was like do you have this like erectile dysfunction or this or anal or what and it just turns out that like what would happen is he'd watch and he'd, he'd like see like gallons of and then like he'd have his normal biological volume of like three to five milliliters and he'd be like this is the pre is what he thought it was <laughs> right because he'd heard about pre and and it's you know and and so we get all these distorted ideas there's also all kinds of stuff about length so if you look at like you know the the nerves on the like the majority of the nerves are in the first like two inches. So if you're like anything over two inches, you'll probably be okay. <laughs> um, Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, he can't help you with that. Everything else no, except no, no, that. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Smartest Whoa. guy on the planet, oh, bro. Oh, come, come on, on. Come on, on man. My Doing bad, I stand corrected. You know, like it, it, he'd, be, he'd be happy to show me his 
it's it's talking about his feelings that I think he'd really be scared about. Oh uh, yeah, I'd probably be more right? more comfortable for sure. Um, so so the, there's all kinds of like conceptions that create problems. We also see other kinds of I- impacts in relationships. This is something that I call death grip syndrome, where a lot of people who are like a lot and are like virgins will have their first act and it's really not enjoyable they have this idea that oh my god it's gonna be like so great it's gonna be so great yep. it's gonna be so great mm-hmm. but then the first time you have it's like this kind of sucks mm-hmm. and oftentimes they actually can't even finish because the the pressure and the lubrication of the is like very different from what people get used to in terms of like you know dry running it yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> dry run death grip <laughs> and, and so sometimes what we'll really have to do is even like retrain the physiology to be like, okay with a new kind of sensation in order to climax. So we'll see like physical aspects like that. And then we'll also see weird emotional things with. So if you look at addiction, it's not even about lust. Oftentimes people who are addicted to are not all the time. They're just bored. They're bored. <laughs> and that's actually the number one thing. I'll be on that bitch trying to find love. In the cotton the comments yeah. <laughs> no nah, not only comments on it when i search it up girl cuddling with guy at- <laughs> yeah, right, so that, there's a sign of trauma um so so then then we sort of uh, we can get a, other kinds of problems with like there's a lot of emotional regulation component to so since and procreation is such a central part of evolution our brain basically pushes everything else to the side mm. so like even if I'm feeling bad about myself if there's a chance to procreate who cares about depression or anxiety, right? And so there's a lot of emotional, powerful emotional regulation circuitry, which activates with. So when I work with some people who have addiction, they'll just have, it's not always about, which is what a lot of people don't understand, or even everyone thinks it's like dopamine. and But a lot of it is emotional suppression. So I'll have people who will like have a second monitor and they're like working on their Excel spreadsheet because they're an accountant and they'll just have on the side because it sort of regulates their emotions what? that's what you usually see with addiction is just a high volume of without necessarily that's orgasm. Crazy. oh wow but we don't talk about it right so this is where everyone's like oh there are a lot of people addicted to who don't realize that this is what's going on mm. what do you think are how how dangerous do you think this is because now it's added the like a they literally have agencies where they're messaging people. And so it's like tricking somebody into thinking that they have a connection with this person. Yeah. So, so I, I think, uh, you know, so it takes and adds a parasocial relationship to it. Right. So, so now, and I think in that way it's dangerous because now we're activating more parts of the brain now, like normally with, it's like, I have no interaction with the I'm watching, but the moment that the, person starts messaging me or even in like a lot of cases of like it is about community right so it's like you're going to ask this content creator to do this particular thing and they will do this particular thing so now you're getting attention Mm. you're getting affection and a lot of times people who will get into these unhealthy relationships they really are starved for attention right and then there's also like other things that i've seen which is i mean oftentimes like even people who are have like problematic stuff with They'll be in healthy romantic relationships. Like oftentimes these people are married, but there's something about an unhappiness within the marriage or something that's lacking in the romantic relationship. Um, You know, oftentimes they have desires that their partner is not willing to entertain. Um, So there's all kinds of stuff that gets complicated and I think it's getting worse. You you said at the beginning when I asked the question, you're like, what are you scared about? Because you said... All your predictions have basically come true, but there are things that we're not even scratching the surface on that could become very dangerous. What are those things? Well, so I think over time, so if you look at the addictiveness of technology, Mm -hmm. the more that it approximates the real world, and it's not even that, that's not even the right way, the more that it triggers more brain regions, the more it approximates the real world, the more addictive it becomes. So let's talk about World of Warcraft. So it used to be that with video games... There was no community element to it, right? So I grew up playing like Final Fantasy Mm One. There's no community, there's no friends list or anything like that, but suddenly you add a massively multiplayer online RPG. We have community, we have friends. Um, I worked with someone who like is an Asian kid who basically like 
ran away from home and lived with her wow guildmates. Right. So, so that even, I don't necessarily know that that's bad because maybe that was actually a healthier place for her to live, but super scary story. But so if you look at what's happening with technology, we're like starting to activate more brain regions. So it used to be that maybe video games just activated dopamine, but now they activate a sense of community, a sense of connection, a sense of empathy. Um, and so what's happening with is we're starting to activate like this parasocial relationship aspect. And then I think over time, what we're going to learn is that what really addicts people in relationships, like if you guys think about, do y'all have friends or maybe y'all, who knows, who are like in unhealthy relationships, mm -hmm. why do they stay in them? Attachment. To what? To the good times, I don't know. Maybe like particular emotional needs. Mm -hmm. so, so would you say that as drama increases in the relationship, does it keep them more attached in the relationship or less attached? More until a certain point. Yeah. So, so right now, there's no drama. In there's no drama. In At some point, we're going to have like virtual girlfriends who will like yeah. get pissed at you. And they'll even like start talking to other people. And then they're going to evoke, they're going to start creating drama because that's going to draw people in. And then what's, what's going to happen is that virtual girlfriend is going to then like the dude is going to get angry, oh my right? Goodness. And then she's going to apologize because that's every man's fantasy when a girl makes drama. It's like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'll never do that to you again. Right. And then, then the dude's going to be hooked or the woman, like we'll see virtual guy friends at some point too. Right. That is dark. Yeah. That's crazy. Happen. Whoa. That's horrifying. Yeah. They're going to start throwing, they're going to start fighting with you and. Be moody and this is gonna ruin like social skills too, right? Because they're just like stuck. Going to? <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it is too late. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So, uh, there was another good video topic that you said of like, why should you not talk about your interests on a first date? Oh, I love this one. I thought that was such an interesting. Yeah. So, so see, here's the thing to understand. There is science about attraction. And the problem is that if we look at dating right now, the data that a dating app has access to does not necessarily correlate with a successful relationship. I don't know if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. But so a dating app can only collect certain things about you. It can collect things like pictures. It can collect your interests. It can't actually con collect a personality match. So if you look at what leads to a successful, or what leads to attraction, so one thing, for example, that leads to attraction is shared emotional experience. It doesn't have to be good. So this is why people fall in love in rehab all the time. So like we have like these really not strict rules because we really can't stop people. We really warn people like don't fall in love in rehab and people fall in love all the time in rehab. From like and trauma? What, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it's, it, it's not just trauma. It's just that we are both sharing these powerful emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at like all the rom-coms, right? The rom-coms, boy, likes, uh, boy doesn't like girl, girl doesn't like boy. What is it that brings them together? It is a shared emotional experience. Now there's a zombie apocalypse and it's just mm -hmm. me and you left, right? So shared emotional experiences leads to attraction. So there's a really fascinating study one of my favorite, where they had first dates in two locations. One is a stone bridge, and one is a rickety wooden bridge. And what they found is that when people met on the rickety wooden bridge, they're both scared. And that intensified the sense of attraction. Mm. So if you really look at like what causes attraction, um, there's, it's like basically three things. One is shared emotional experience. The second is it has to be hassle-free. So most people are looking for romance to not be a pain in the ass. And so if you make it like too much of a pain in the ass to like, do you want to go here? Do you want to meet here? Are you there yet? Am I late? Are you late? Why aren't you texting me back? This creates a hassle that does not create romance. It's like different. The whole point of romance is there's like no hassle, right? You're there. I'm there. We're looking at each other. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, like, how's it going? There's no, there's no hassle to it. So it has to be hassle-free, has to be shared emotional experience. And there's nothing in the science of attraction that says that two people who like the same thing are going to be more attracted to each other. So mm. everyone talks about their interests, but like, you know, that is fine, but it doesn't actually lead to attraction. Mm -hmm. What do you think is like the perfect first date? Like throw out, throw out an example. Cause I was like an escape room, And then I was like, Oh, it doesn't check the box of hassle free. Right. Uh, so what is the perfect date? So if you want, 
uh, so I think it's it's something that is probably 75 minutes at the, at, at the upper end. Mm -hmm. So do not go on a long date. Um, there's data that shows that romantic interest wanes with time. Mm -hmm. So like 60 to 75 minutes is probably ideal. You want to make things as easy as possible. So if you sort of think about it, like I'm kind of thinking from a male-centric perspective, but your date should be something that she is looking forward to, not something that is a pain in the ass for her. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that's the second thing. So make it as hassle free as possible. So try to do as much as you can for to like smooth things on the date. And then the third thing is to have some kind of shared emotional experience. So do something like if you guys like want to ride a roller coaster for an hour, like I know that's kind of weird, but, <laughs> you know, so that would work. But I think there are other things that you can do that are shared emotional experiences like, hey, mm -hmm. let's go listen to like this band play or something like that. Mm -hmm. And if they both like the music, then that's good because we're enjoying it. But the key thing is to have enjoyment. And so if you think about what's a fun date, it's when we're vibing. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean, vibing? Vibing means you're in one emotional place and I'm in the same emotional place. Mm -hmm. So there are certain conversational techniques that you can do to form emotional connections, which I've been doing with him over the last hour and a half or so. <laughs> and, and that's not to create romance. It's just, you know, you can empathize with people. I'm in yeah. love with you. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's confusing, I know. But he's, he's so easy. In love and love are two different things. <laughs> Um, so, and, and that's where it kind of depends on what kind of emotional, and it doesn't have to be positive emotions either. So mm -hmm. even something simple is like, you know, if you walk by a homeless person who kind of heckles y'all a little bit and is scary for both of you, you'll be more attracted to each other. Mm -hmm. but fake, I'm not fake, that, fake a robbery. You yeah. could do that. Yeah. Well, so faking a robbery wouldn't work. So let's understand why. So when you fake a robbery, let's say I, I pay, you pay me to rob you. Yeah. Okay. And what is your emotional experience during faking a robbery? Uh, I'm a hero. No, no, you know it's gonna happen. So you're oh. not in the same emotional place as her. Ah. Look at this guy! Wow, this suits, guy. Suits, baby. Yeah. Suits. Suits. Let's go, son. Oh. Very good, right, Doctor Vit. Thank you. Yeah. So, so th this is uh, precisely so that faking robbery won't work. Mm. Mm. That's funny. You have to have your friend pay yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> your friend friend someone else. Ambush you. Yeah, yes. there you go. There you go. There you go. Wow. Yeah. So shared emotional experience. So like if you, you know, watch something or go to a comedy club and y'all are both laughing, like that'll be good. So shared wow. emotional experience. Mm, okay. You guys okay. can both talk about your trauma growing up. Like that'll work. Mm. Trauma that growing. always leads trauma to dumping. not very good relationships, I've noticed. So now we get to a second point, which is that attraction is different from successful relationships. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. You're good at attraction. You're just not good at the yeah, second part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Wait, uh, the, are we... Time? Yeah, I want to make sure you... Yeah, we... We also have to take thumbnails, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to take thumbnails. Don't forget. Like uh, I guess... Let's wrap up in 5 to 15. Does that work? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or now. Oh, yeah, we could wrap. Okay. Yeah, that was like two hours. So, yeah, thank you for your time. That was amazing. Yeah, One last awesome. question. If you were to create a, a dating app or, or what is the best way in your eyes of how people can, you know, find a significant other? Because I feel like more people, I have a lot of friends that are on dating apps and are very unsuccessful. Yeah. So I think I would not use an app. Mm. So the first thing is if we look at um, the way that human beings form connections, the best way to form a connection is organically, which means that you need to have multiple unplanned interactions. So if you look at like... That's damn near impossible nowadays. Work from home. Like. It, is, it, is, it is damn near impossible. So that's so if you're asking me what would I create. So for example, like there's this lady in Austin who just started doing this thing where she said, I'm going to meet at 8.30 in the morning at this place and I'm going to go for a walk for two hours. And we're just like, it's not like networking. It's not speed dating. It's just a way for human beings to hang out and get to know each other for two hours. Her thing has like blown up. So on the one hand, it is very hard because there are so few of these places. And at the same time, everyone is looking for something like this. So I think things like meetups, and this is where people are like, I don't know where to find something like this, then make it. Mm. Right? So if you are looking for something that does not exist in the world, yep. right? Then, then, okay, I want a hard seltzer that has different flavors like mango melon and green grape like whatever right so so you can create that thing but i think basically like if you got you got to create a situation that's low pressure because oh. mm. then what happens is is if you go on these dates right what what they turn into is like job interviews mm -hmm. like especially as y'all get older i don't know how old y'all are but like as you get a little bit older it's
scary, dude, because people are like, you know, because like women are like over 30 and it's like, if we want to have kids, we got to get going. Right. And, and so then it's like this job interview, but the emotional valence is completely different. It's like, are you good enough for this? Yeah. Or, you know, and then it's like, but like, it's like weird. Definitely like a job interview. Yeah. And so we don't want that to be a job interview. So try to create as organic of an interaction as possible, like invite people over to your house or go somewhere. And then that's the other tricky thing is that what we find is multiple planned, unplanned interactions. Mm. This is why college is so great because I have to go to class every day and you have to go to class every day. That's why so many people like date in college because we have multiple unplanned interactions. I'm just imagining some guy figuring out someone's schedule so he could pretend to be at the grocery store at the same time. <sighs> Joe Goldberg. It's, it's straight up like impossible, I think, in today's day. And unless it's created and you really go out of your way. But hey, there's a billion dollar business idea for somebody out there right now. Yeah, well, thank you so much. This was super enlightening. I've, I've learned so much. I'm sure they have yeah. as well. I didn't want to talk because I was like, yeah, I'm just going to listen. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah, it was good. Um, what, are you, what are you most excited about? Like, what would you like to promote? What's, yeah, what do you got going on that you'd like to share I mean, with our so, audience? So the thing that's top of mind is we just filmed a guide to trauma, which I think is very good. Yeah. So I think our understanding of trauma and the biggest mistake that we make about trauma is we think it's an illness. So what I've learned, like after almost 10 years of practicing medicine is trauma is not an illness. It's an adaptation. It's a solution. It's not a problem. So it's the only thing that is our brain and our body wiring to survive. And then the problem is it becomes maladaptive. So if you are struggling with some, something that like you have some kind of pattern in your life that you can't break out of, really understanding the physiology, the psychology, the neuroscience, even the spirituality and approaching it with every layer of being is when I've seen truly transformative work. Um, and it's kind of like a guide about understanding how a human being gets shaped because that's what trauma does. It shapes us. And then once you understand how to mold the clay, you have the tools at your disposal to mold yourself into whatever you want. How much, uh, you know, as a, as a doctor, like how much do you care about like uh, psychedelic therapy, like ketamine or Molly or those shrooms and using those tools to like pull somebody out of like really deep, like, yeah. So, so habits. I think it's, I, I think it, I'm cautiously optimistic. So there are a couple things that we have to understand. So the first is I've had just as many or even more patients who have had trauma induced from trips. I've had people that have like permanent anxiety disorders and panic attacks after like bad trips. So the way to think about psychedelics is you're kind of like, most of the time our brain is in read only mode and psychedelics sort of opening up, uh, opening it up for editing. But if you don't do the right thing, you can end up up yourself. Mm. So if you look at historically the use of psychedelics, it's not just people getting high. There's mm. always a shaman involved. Mm. There's a spiritual tradition. And what we know from the studies on psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is that you'll have like 12 weeks of psychotherapy with three uses of psychedelics kind of interspersed throughout that. And that's what leads to good outcomes. Mm. It's not just the drug itself. It's understanding how to contextualize the drug, having someone to guide you so that things don't go bad. And then I think it has a lot of healing potential. Mm. Mm, like ayahuasca. Yeah. There's like a whole bunch of people that just help you out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, cool. Was Thank there, you guys oh, wait, so much. By the way, where can people find the trauma guide? Where, they, where can they find you? So trauma guide will be at healthygamer.gg. Um, and then like most people find us on YouTube. Yeah. So just healthy gamer GG on YouTube. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And if you could have uh, one thing that you'd like our audience to do, what would you like them to do for you? Uh, I would like them to breathe without notice your, uh, observe your breath without changing it. That's what I want them to do. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Try it Thank out. you. Love this episode. Love Thank you guys. Thank so you amazing. so much. Thank yeah. you. Hey guys, we're under the influence. And if you're enjoying our clips and you want to see the full episodes, you can go to our website. We have them all linked to every audio streaming platform and YouTube. If you like, comment, and subscribe over there, it really helps us out. Please, we haven't paid the rent in months. If you're looking for us or any of the guests, we always tag them. Also, if you have any topics or questions you want to ask us, go to our website or text this number on the screen. If you're feeling thirsty, drink Nectar, Nectar Hard, Hard Seltzer. Seltzer. Delicious Asian flavors and no weird aftertaste. We ship to 45 states. 
Use code UTI15 at checkout on our website for 15% off your first box. And if you want some of the best bartending tools money can buy, you can use the same code UTI15 on barchemistry.com for 15% off. Thank you guys for your support. We really appreciate it. And if you leave mean comments, please stop. They really hurt our feelings. But if you don't, we love you.